He was huge. He was huge. He was huge. At times, I'm not saying it's a nice thing to say. No, but, but when he was running for governor with um, Kim Godano, if we saw a picture with him without Kim Godano, we wondered if he ate her. <laughs> I mean, I don't mean that in a bad way. Kim, please. Um, you know, I know you would never let that happen, but, um, you know, ultimately, so so that, I, uh, I just Kim, saw I him. I did not eat Kim. I did not. I did not eat her. I did not eat her, you know, <laughs> but I just saw him a few weeks ago at a Rutgers football game and he get, you know, he's like, he hugged me, but he gave me the finger, you know, so. Um, All right. So yeah, you're somewhat so cool. We're, we're good. Yeah. He, we're, knew, he knew you were right. We're good. He knew, if, and, it, and it, you know, incentivized him to lose like like 13 pounds which was great so <laughs> he went from 400 to 387 it was beautiful what's cooking everybody he's back i am joined in the bunker today by none other than my very good friend and former special agent in the fbi mr jim special agent jim diorio Jim was an absolute hit the first time he was here for number 48. I don't know anyone that didn't like that episode. It is, I think now it's it's definitely the most popular episode of all time. There, there are a few that are right there with it on the audio side, but I, I think Jim's is officially on the audio side the most popular, and it was far and away the most popular on YouTube. So for months, people have asked me to bring him back. And I have played it coy and said, of course he's coming back. But I wanted to hold it off. I want to try to spread it out because it's it's pretty electric when he comes in here. And I, I want to make sure we maximize it and take all the different things that are happening in the world and at least touch what we can of them and, and go through it. So I actually have a little surprise for you guys. I don't think I'm recording this before I put out the episode. I don't think I'm going to put this in the title. So this is going to be a total surprise unless I did, in which case, sorry. But Jim was actually here for almost six and a half hours. So you're going to see we have an episode this week, but we also have an episode next week. And we, we weren't even done at the end. That's the amazing thing. I could talk with this guy all day because there's just so many different things to talk about in our crazy fun and also fucked up world that you know, there was no way I couldn't stay in here and, and keep going. So I even said maybe a little less than two hours into the podcast, I could already feel it. And I'm like, you got a hotel. We're, we're going to keep going. So this week, very different vibe from last time. Now, I am still deciding where I'm going to pick up the podcast. I may pick it up like 15, 20 minutes in. I might not. If If I don't, You'll hear stories about like Don Pepe and some funny things like that that Jim talked about at the beginning. If I don't take it off, if I do, you won't hear that and it'll pick up, I forget, somewhere. I'll make that decision afterwards. But I would say that if, if you look at the timestamps, I'll definitely have it clear in there. Shit started to get real. Maybe like 15 to 20 minutes into us talking. And then we had some hilarious Chris Christie stories. That was wild because Jim used to used to work for the good old U.S. District Attorney or whatever he was back then. And then we got into, I actually want to check my notes here. I never do this, but I, I really want to make sure here. Yeah, after that, we got into the next election in the state of society. Very interesting convo there. Love listening to Jim's thoughts on that stuff. We later got into his buddy, Mike Pompeo, who was just the Secretary of State, as well as the head of the CIA before that, and is somebody who's being talked about as running in 2024 and seems to be preparing for doing so. I want to make a note that maybe of all of them in here, that is the shining light example of why I appreciate Jim so much, because I know how he talks about Mike. I know that he goes way back with him, was his roommate at West Point, loves the guy. And, you know, Mike is also a public figure, and I tend to disagree with a lot of public figures. So there are issues I have with certain stances that Secretary Pompeo has. And unlike other people who would be in that position, Jim sat in here and had the conversation and was, I think, fair would be understating it. So I, I really, really appreciate that. We got into a lot of stuff around Julian Assange and Snowden as it relates to Pompeo. That is a place where I have a major disagreement with him and some of his stances while he was in office. And so that, that was a, that was a really, really cool part of the conversation. But after that, there were, first of all, 
there's stories everywhere in this thing. I think I, I'd lost count. I think Jim told like a hundred stories in just the first part here, the first three hours. But we also talked about something really, really special that happened from the last episode we did together. There's a little bit of a second part to that. And I'm not even going to say what that was. It's just, it's like the coolest thing ever. And it really, it almost had me in tears. That was pretty awesome. But Jim also walked right into a favorite topic of mine. He didn't know it, but the San Bernardino shooter. If you remember from 2015, that was, he was a terrorist who, who killed a bunch of people out in San Bernardino, California. And I talk about it often, not from the fact that he was a terrorist and did this. We know that part, but I talk about how Tim Cook, if you remember, refused to hand over the iPhone. The terrorist had an iPhone. It obviously had information on there. The FBI wanted it, and they got in a public disagreement where Tim said, I don't want to set that precedent. Now, if you know my position, and I'll talk all about it here, and Jim will talk about his, my position is that that was the right decision. That was protecting user privacy. It sucks that he's a terrorist and you want to just give it, but where does it end, right? Jim as it turns out, was directly involved in those conversations and feels the opposite way. And so I, again, very much appreciate it. I think we talked about that for like 25 minutes and he let me put all my points out there. He put some counterpoints out there and we find a, we found a little bit of middle ground too, which was cool, but just, just a very, very cool second act to the Jim DiOrio zone that happens here on Trend of Fire. There were other things. I won't mention them. You guys check the timestamps. Enjoy the episode. I, I know you'll love this one. But yeah, next week, also amazing shit. Amazing shit. I haven't even finished that edit, but there are a lot of things that we did not get to touch in the last podcast that we got into in both of these. And then I also made sure that at some point in here, I won't tell you where, we did go after a couple things that were left kind of unsaid, shall I say, in the last podcast that a lot of people were asking about, especially after the TikTok clips and, and after the YouTube episodes started to do really well. So I wanted to make sure we had a full encompassing experience. Thank you to Jim for providing it. He did not disappoint. I really, really love this guy. I go the end of the earth for him. And I hope you guys all enjoy the special agent, our special agent, Jim Diorio. That said, you know what it is. I'm Julian Dory, and this is Trend of Fire. Let's go. This is one of the great questions in our culture. Where is the nuance? You're giving opinions and calling them facts. You feel me? Everyone understands this, but few seem to do it. If you don't like the status quo, start asking questions. about this before and it's one thing that will bother me to my grave and that is um many times it's not it's not the processing or analysis of the information it's the decision making by those who can charge that particular violation right mm. so let's think about it right every four years sometimes eight years sometimes in the middle of those dual terms there's a kind of a restaffing of federal prosecutors so, How does this work? Can you explain this to so, people? So you can almost guarantee that when a new administration comes aboard, there's one of two things is going to happen across the 56 districts that comprise the U.S. attorney's offices across America, right? Which is which are the federal prosecutors who um, move forward charges from each federal agency. So we're talking, you know, from everything from FBI to IRS, CID, to DEA, to ATF, to U.S. Postal Inspectors, um, to, you know, every every OIG, every Office of Inspector General, whether it be um, Health and Human Services, whether it be, um, you know, Housing and Human Development, it doesn't, Urban Development, doesn't really matter, but they will be responsible to make the decisions towards prosecution. If you remember my frustration with Jim Comey, you know, not taking on on the fact as the FBI director, what his role normally would have been as the U.S. attorney in the, the Ninth District of California. And you know my feelings about the Ninth District of Ninth Circuit in California. So um, <laughs> long story short is I believe that 
America is unaware, most people are unaware of the fact that each of these positions, each of these U.S. attorneys does one of two things upon a new administration. They either resign because they see the handwriting on the wall and they've got opportunities outside of public service. So they're going to go back to their law firm. They're going to start a law firm. They're going to be, you know, gobbled up by some of the finest law firms in America, right? They're going to go work there because what, not, not for their legal acumen, most of them, but for their network, right? So that's going to either happen and, and you're going to see an acting from the party in power or an acting attorney acting yep. attorney u.s attorney right and that can that can go on I, i've had examples of guys being acting for two three four years before Think they're about confirmed how many things they have to staff and they have to get signed off like in the white house a absolutely it's like a million jobs. i mean you can't even get the background checks done in a timely fashion you know i mean can't even get the background checks done so now that's one thing that can happen the second thing that can happen is that you you now have someone that's sitting um, and realizes that, in fact, they can't move a case. Even if they're going to stay, I'm going to stay the course. I'm going to be, you know, the U.S. attorney and support the District of New Jersey. Um, but shit, I can't move anything up. <laughs> I can't move anything up the ladder. So, so what is that person really doing in order to promote justice? Nothing. And it's not their, It's not that they choose to do nothing. It's just that they have, when they go to that next level, let me talk to, uh, you know, the attorney general or one of the, one of the deputy attorney generals in D.C. who's, you know, in charge of the terrorism division, for instance. He's going to say, uh, thanks a lot, but we'll wait. We'll wait until your real appointee shows up before we discuss important adult matters like that. Right? So if you think about the frustration of a guy sitting, looking at videos and saying, Damn, that's that's got to be chargeable. These cops ran this guy down, or or you know, uh, or they didn't. That was a great shoot, i.e., Columbus, Ohio, right? Greatest shoot I've ever seen in my life. Right. I hate to say it, I hate to see people die, but great shoot, right? So I'm looking at it and making Are that you decision. Talking about the one that was in like oh, April, crazy. where the girl had her at knife point. What, what comes we, guy we, comes you know rolling what? at the cop? Boom. We, we talked about that. We last did. Time. Talk we already about covered that. But, yeah, but that was my, fucked up. But my point is, you know. I'm I'm excited and um, extremely meticulous about my viewing and my note taking and my understanding of the statutes with regards to what happened on that video. However, the frustrating part is I can bring that to a assistant United States attorney, you know, maybe late twenties, early thirties, who hasn't had um, as much experience as a litigator but who is aggressive, smart, wants to move things forward, only to find that they say, Jim, I took it to, or, you know, whoever, I took it to my boss, and they just really don't see a chance to, to win that case, right? So frustration in many ways in society, right? So, you know, the communities look at this and say, what the fuck? Right. You know what I mean? Like, this is clear, and we're you're looking at it. We're looking at it. I'm looking at it now as a retired guy and saying, Jesus. So true, but but that's the reality of it. It's not like somebody sitting there saying, "Let's decline, man. That's nothing. Let's protect. Let's." It's it, it's a it's a slow, you know, um, frustratingly inherent process. There's so many layers to it, though, too. And yeah. like, I want to go after all the layers today. I want to get into the agencies. I want to talk about some abuses i want to talk about also what's what is necessary too i think we forget that like i'm gonna be the first guy to sit here and talk about edward snowden and, and mm -hmm. be very happy about about some of the things that he put out there that we kind of wasted by the way nice job america but you know i'm also then gonna look at hey there's there's a necessary force that goes on here you as, as the united states of america yeah, you need to have the NSA. You need to have the CIA. They have to be able to do some things. You need to have the FBI. They have to be able to do some things. That's how it works. It's just like I want to see more of the balance there and pull some of the shit out of the darkness because what I'm seeing is people – not that there was a fuck ton of trust. Just it's generally popular not trust like government officials and stuff. Like it's a – it's always a popular thing to sure. do, but the lack of trust now is at such an all time high. And I think like talking with someone like you who has been in the quote unquote machine for your entire adult life, you've seen it, you, you understand what it is. People are going to take what you say with some grain of salt, but like one of the things they liked about you last time is you're very open about this stuff. And so I like to be able to get there, but to stay right on what you're talking about right now, 
it's that gamification thing, which I touched on a little bit last time on something else, but this is the other side of it. The other side of it is when you're talking about like the prosecutors who are their career building. It's what it is. They have to take a case that they're going to win. So who's incentivized to bring them a case that they're going to win? The FBI, whatever agency is working on it. So when the FBI is making a case, there is a quote unquote incentivization for them to pick out the ones that they feel like have a higher percentage chance, regardless of as the leaders of executing the law itself, which the FBI is the highest police force in the country, regardless of whether or not that knowledge and that principle, more importantly, that they have says that case A is actually a way more important case than case B, they're, they're, supposed, to pick, they're supposed to pick the case based on what actually has the – the the criminal element to it so i may have that was a little confusing how no, i said I understand that what you're saying. but like there there shouldn't be the well we really should prosecute a but we have a better chance of prosecuting b so we're going to take b uh, without a doubt and i had a long time well respected federal prosecutor who i brought many cases to say to me one time and it was more or less him reciting his boss's kind of credo and it was, hey, look, all right, we we never, ever, ever lose 100% of the cases we don't bring. And that was the philosophy, right? So if you are a... Fear of loss. Fear of loss. And so if you are a guy that is a career prosecutor, you don't give a shit. Bring them all. Bring them all. You know, but if you're a guy that's looking to chip away, and and let's face it, what many of these U.S. attorneys go on to one of two things: hire public office, or back to a pretty prestigious law firm where they attract cases from those in higher public office. I mean, yes, that that's the bottom line. So my thought is always, you know, along those lines, and I I would temper my presentations towards that, towards okay. Where does this as here's the evidence one one you know two two separate things here's the evidence here's the case here's the prosecutorial memo that I'm going to bring to you know a USA a now I would also look at what drives assistant United States attorney a versus what by what drives B C D E and F and then I would make a decision where I and was the going ninth with district. it that's why right here right. Oh, God <laughs> Almighty yeah I wouldn't bring anything there I I just bring my golf clubs there's, there's nothing to do out there you know. So ultimately, I mean, I think that's that's a part of it too. That um, you know, you watch any, you watch FBI, you know, that show, those shows on C- entertaining as hell. You watch, you know, um, whatever NCIS Hawaii, or you watch, uh, you know, CSI Las Vegas. They get it done quickly. Every they, they never have to deal with a prosecutor. They just make their own decisions. Mm-hmm. I wish and, and Jim Comey watched a lot of those shows. Clearly, <laughs> people, right? So m- my thought is always that's the part that people don't understand that we are really the professional law enforcement, you know, kind of um, fraternal, you know, sororal organizations are really key on thinking about all those different things that the evidence doesn't necessarily totally support. Mm -hmm. How do I get this? If I, if I need to make this case because it's the right thing to do, how do I get it there? How do I get it past over the hump? Once you get it over the hump a couple times, it's like, listen, it's like the same thing I'm going through now with Jersey Mike's, right? Like once I get the first store up and running and I prove that my operations and my systems are well done, Two comes quick. Three, four, five, and five are going to come quicker, right? It's the same thing. Once I prove to a federal prosecutor that, listen, this is the right reason. This is the right case for the right reason, and it only ben- – sir, ma'am, it only benefits you. I mean, I'm a, I'm a stupid career you know, FBI agent, but you are going to be the governor, or you are going to be a presidential candidate. By the way, I got to tell the story. Can I, can I tell, did I tell the story about Chris Christie last time? No, I feel bold. I feel in by by the way, very quickly, yeah, to cut you off there. Yeah, I just want to note for the record that we just compared our federal agencies and the way that prosecution in this country works to Jersey Mike's, and I don't think that's the most reassuring thing (laughs) to people out there. Well, they make we make a good sub, (laughs) but but you know what I'm saying, systems are everything, right? So, systems Uh, and thoughts and how you prove yourself to the man 
in this case, Mr. Cancro or Mr. Summers or the guys that run Jersey Mike's as opposed, you know, the same guys, Mr. You know, I worked for, uh, you know, Mr. Christie for many years. I w- worked for Mr. Fishman. I worked for all these U.S. attorneys that were that oh, worked right, for Mr. Right. Comey. You know, okay. Jim Comey. I don't call him Mr. Fucking. <laughs> but, but let me tell you the Chris Christie story because this is great. So Christie, you love Jim Comey. Oh, he's love your him. He's my guy. favorite. He's, he's just a great guy. guy. He's so he's so you know upbeat and so you know tough. You send him Christmas cards. Uh, I I've sent him a couple notes. I won't say they're Christmas cards. Yeah, re- more recently than not. <laughs> he'll, he'll be a character in the books you and I are going to write together, okay. the fiction books. All right, so good. Um, fiction only. We'll call him based Shim on Shim Shmomi. There you go, Shim Shmomi. Perfect. That's it. Perfect. The former director. From the, uh, we'll call it the 19th district out there on the on the West Coast. Oh, okay. Um, circuit, whatever. Um, so anyway, we come into uh, my, probably my, I don't know, 20th or 25th corruption case when I was working purely corruption for a period of time in my career with the greatest partner that ever walked the face of the earth. Greatest, greatest corruption fighter agent, guy named Bob Cook, who's now out in Harrisburg, PA. I love him. He's the best. Hope he's listening. Uh, miss him, whatever. So- Cook and I get this case, and it's it's a guy that was managing a utilities authority in Monmouth County, right? So he's managing this. Now, he can't understand, even though we talked to him several times, listen, you understand that you are an appointed official. You weren't elected, but you're appointed mm. by an elected body, which means the utilities authority is not your business. You don't own it. So a few times we gave him a little warning. We said, be careful about bartering your utilities authority, you know, for sewer lines and different places for builders in an area, big area in Monmouth County, huge area, and it's it's overgrown at this point. But you said this to the guy we before said it to you him. did it. We said it to him because we we had some inkling, and we were trying, obviously, to flip him to become a, an informant because he could have really helped us out with corrupt builders, which led right up to the state. You think about it, affordable housing is a mess in the state still, right? It could have straightened this all out 20 right. years ago, right? So we tell him, just be careful. Okay. He didn't. He doesn't understand. So he he thinks. Listen, if I tie in a, sh- a couple more sewer lines for you, you'll do a fence <laughs> at my house. If I give your if I give your company which paints and does stonework all the work around the utilities authority, you'll do my daughter's back porch. She really wants a beautiful deck. Well, finally he gets charged. So we tell him you're charged. Listen, if you if you cooperate and you take a plea. How long was it to like from conversation two to months. charge? Two months. Oh, he was yeah. doing it two give, months. You didn't give him too long. No, <laughs> but but I mean he started he was doing it like the day after. Good. Right? So it, we say actually to him, people should be very reassured hearing that. You didn't waste any time. No time. You're like, here's your warning. Oh, you still want to do it? No Goodbye. time. So we go to him again. Yeah. Listen, you're gonna get charged tomorrow. I'm gonna come here with handcuffs in the morning. We we're waiting, we got a grand jury sitting waiting to indict you. However, if you decide to get it, let's get an attorney, take a plea. You're gonna do. You're gonna do no time in jail. You're gonna pay a fine, and you're gonna walk on. You're gonna be ah, fuck that. I'm going to going to trial. <laughs> Goes to trial. What happens? He gets convicted. Not only does he get convicted, he gets his son and daughter to lie on the stand. Oh, that was the guy. Right. That was him. So oh, shit. That's Christie's one hundredth victory. Uh, he goes a hundred. No, wait. You'll love this. So, so we Chris go, Christie was the guy. Are you in that case? No, no, never, never showed. No, he was eating. Uh, <laughs> um, that's terrible I, should, I mean chris i do like you i hope you don't give me the finger again the next time uh, you see me. but God. so he we go anyway we're entertaining um i'm entertaining the 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 young assistant u.s attorneys right after this trial they did a great job they're great dudes it's like seven or eight of them standing around uh one woman who's fantastic who's risen to the great level in justice she's fantastic sitting around i'm telling them all jokes they're laughing at every single joke i'm like i'm on fire right <laughs> so bob cook's laughing whatever so i say all right guys we gotta go you know you gotta get back and celebrate back in the fbi office um listen i got one more for you so like okay so i said how come the new york yankees cannot sign any more free agents so they look at me how come we don't know i said because that fat fuck chris christie took all the pinstripes for his last suit <laughs> <laughs> Nobody, Listen, nobody no laughs. laughs. No way. I said, he's right behind me, isn't he? <laughs> Come on, he was I right I turn there. around and he's there and he, he, he maintained his composure. He said, uh, head back to your office. <laughs> I said, no problem. So no cell phones, right? So I'm sweating it the whole way. My pager is, is lighting up. 911, 911, call the office, 911, 911, right? So I'm like, I'm not calling because I know who it is, <laughs> right? So at the time, my boss, the position I had, but I was a young agent, you know, just 
cracking cases left and right, you know, cracking them, turned down a nice job with progressive insurance, which by the way, I probably should have taken because I'd be a multimillionaire because they're killing it. Stock split like 75 times <laughs> by progressive. Um, so what happens is I get to the office and everybody's, now we, we were in the gateway building in Newark. So you had to walk this long place. There was Dunkin' Donuts. Everybody's looking at me like, oh shit, like all my fellow agents. I'm like, uh-oh, you know, <laughs> all right, know what's happening. So my boss at the time was a guy named Aaron Ford, who's now in charge of uh, PSE&G's entire security system. Great dude. Um, played played football. His claim to fame, he's played at Tennessee State with Richard Dent, who was the 1985 yeah. Super Bowl yes. MVP. Dent, the refrigerator. No, not the right, fridge, no, but he was Willie. he was on the other side. That's um That was Willie uh, uh, Willie, um refrigerator Perry. Yes, William Perry or whatever it, it's right. It. So he's on the Dent was on the opposite side of the line. He was the other defensive end. Long story short is I Ford played with these guys, right? At and then he played for the Packers for a couple of years. So big huge dude, great guy, great guy. So I get, you know, I get in and uh, walking up and my secretary says, hey, uh, the boss wants to see you. I said, I know, you know. So I walk upstairs, I get the bit long elevator ride from 15 to 23. I get up to 23, go in, walk in. How you doing? Hey, Louis, can I see? Yeah, yeah, he's here. He's waiting for you. I know. I walk in. He's just sitting behind his desk, cool as cool can be, right? So he looks up. Did you say it? I said, yeah, of course I did. Boss. He goes, funny as shit, you're suspended for two weeks. <laughs> so I'm like, now? You Wait, mean now? Pay? Yeah, no, no, no pay. <laughs> now I'm I'm barely making. We're barely making a mortgage. We have two young kids. My oh wife's my not. God. My wife at the time's not working. Right, so I got to go home. I got to drive home. Now you don't. You can't keep your gun. You can't keep your credentials, and you can't keep your car. So I got to call from my office, my ex, and say, "Can you come up and pick me up?" You know, to Newark from Point Pleasant. And you don't have a car. She drives up, picks me up the whole way back. She, what's going? What's going to happen? I don't know. I don't know. Now, it has always been tradition in the FBI. This was that, all over a Chris Christie joke. And he was just like, remember, he, he's got to appease the U.S. attorney or the office gets no cases prosecuted, right? So I am a linchpin in this thing, right? So I'm all I'm worried about is I, this is a legendary story. I'm going to be a legend. I don't care, right? Which my ex didn't think was funny, right? But at the same time, I am out. You know, at the time, it was probably three grand for those two weeks I was yeah. out, right? So I get home, and I'm sitting there, and, and two days later, I get a phone call from one of my best buddies there. And he's like, hey, you know, feel really bad. Can can we grab coffee tomorrow morning? So I said, yeah, sure. So I meet him out at local Point Pleasant, you know, Dunkin' Donuts, and we're sitting in there, and he's like, uh, I got something for you in the car. You know, so I said, all right, good. I figured he's got, like, a gun with one bullet so I can end it. You know, that's the way he said it. So we walk out, and he goes, here you go. And he hands me... I've been getting a bunch of messages from you guys over the past few weeks showing me the latest athlete, celebrity, entertainer, or CEO who is now going public with the fact that they use an 8 Sleep Pod Pro mattress or 8 Sleep Pod Pro cover, and I love this. You guys know how I feel about the product. I love hearing about important people in society who have adopted it and see the value in it because, look, I, I push it on this show but I use it myself. It's absolutely incredible, and it's a total game changer. It's what I say every week, and it's nice to see that a lot of people are agreeing. The real question that you should be asking yourself, though, is why are these people suddenly all using this product? I mean, frankly, you're not getting paid a ton of money to be like an affiliate marketer, and half the people talking about it aren't an affiliate marketer. They're just talking about how they love it. Why are they doing that? They're doing it because they found something that gives them more energy and actually changes their ability to do more successful shit every single day. And that's what I talk about with this thing. You will wake up in the morning after using your 8 Sleep Pod Pro mattress or 8 Sleep Pod Pro cover and you will feel like you slept two hours more than you actually did because your body is fully energized because your sleep was optimized around you by 8 Sleep's proprietary app that ties right into the cover, right into the mattress, whichever one you choose and changes your life in the process. So use the link in my description, along with the code TRENDIFIER at checkout. That's T-R-E-N-D-I-F-I-E-R. And you will get $100 off either the full-blown 8 Sleep Pod Pro mattress or the 8 Sleep Pod Pro cover, which is what I use. It's about half the price, does all the same things, comes in queen or king sizes, and goes right on top of your current mattress that you have. Do it. You'll love it. Code TRENDIFIER, checkout, $100 off. Check it out a huge manila envelope that we would pay public officials off with. Oh, they And all he says, don't, cash. don't, yeah, don't count it here. Oh my God. Because I don't know if what we call our SOG is our, our surveillance operations group. And sometimes they'll put like, especially 
those who are looking to jam people up, agents up, internal affairs, our internal affairs, it's called OPM or OPR. It's called uh, Office of Professional Responsibility. They're looking to jam up anybody that can, including the boss, because if he authorizes this payment, yeah, right. So I, anyway, I, you know, I'm like, thank you so much, you know, whatever. He goes, yeah, go home and, and do it, you know. So I get my my personal car, my POV. <laughs> I ride home, and it's like Christmas morning, right? So I open the envelope. All right, seventeen k <sighs> cash. Best joke you ever made. So I said, I looked at my ex and I said, I, sh I should just do this more often. <laughs> now, if the IRS is listening, I did pay taxes on that. Right. No. Um, but long story short is that was like, you know, that's, that's the beauty, I think, of the organization's appreciation for standing up for against, because it brought the guy down. I mean, he was a totally different guy after that. He was approachable. He realized that we made, we're the ones that made him 100 and 0. He never stepped foot in the classroom or in the classroom in the court. I mean he was he was a rather fat Dude, individual. he was huge he was huge he was huge he was huge at times I'm not saying it's a nice thing to say no but, but when he was running for governor with um, Kim Godano if we saw a picture with him without Kim Godano we wondered if he ate her <laughs> I mean I don't mean that in a bad way Kim please um you know I know you would never let that happen but um you know ultimately so so that I, uh, I just Kim, saw him I did not eat Kim I did not I did not eat her I did not eat her you know but I just saw him a few weeks ago at a Rutgers football game and he get you know he's like he hugged me but he gave me the finger you know so um all right so yeah, you're so cool. we're, we're good yeah he, we're, knew, he knew you were right we're good he knew if, and, it, and it you know incentivized him to lose like like 13 pounds which was great so <laughs> he went from 400 to 387 it was beautiful but anyway uh, i digress he's like honestly like it's a little bit sad to me though watching him because he like was trump's lackey and then jump ship and then came back on and then jump ship and now he's on abc and now it's like unfortunately these people who are on the right or left and just get politically opportunistic now that's just who they are. And yeah. like, if people are on that side, it's kind of weird on the right side because like people are either like pro Trump or not Trump. So it's a little different. But like, if people are on one of the two sides, they'll get with it. They yeah. don't care. Yeah. And so it, it kind of pisses me off because like a guy like that, like to me, he's just playing the political game. And like he, and clearly he doesn't have stomach, no pun intended, for waiting around on things to play out like he's a quick jump ship kind of guy I, I couldn't agree more and i had read something recently and, and i i i kind of can't find any more information on it but supposedly um christy and and pompeo teamed up to be like i forget what they called it, it was like republican coalition for the good or something it was some they, they were kind of teaming up together when? I want to say in the last couple months, and, and I can't find anything else. And, and I'll find out a lot more about it um, in the next couple of weeks. I, I've got my I've got my thirty fifth West Point reunion next week, uh, and it's kind of first time we've gone kind of off um, West Point's campus. So we're going actually down to Dallas, and Army is playing Air Force in a football game on Saturday the seventh. Um, at the new Arlington uh, Texas Rangers baseball stadium. Mm -hmm. So we're excited about it. So I'll find out more. Mike's going, Ulrich's going, Brian's going, you know, all the guys. So I have it behind us too. Do, do you see it? Yeah, yeah. You can look right here on the screen behind us. Right there. See it? All right. So just, just to yeah. give like clarity on what you were talking about. The group charge, this is from The Hill, by the way. The group charge. By the way, Mike's lost a ton of weight. I saw he that. He looks great. We can talk about that. The group charge with coordinating the GOP's re redistricting strategy, which is all a fucked up system. So it's all mid. It's all tapped, mid. Right, they tapped former elections. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo right. and former New Jersey Governor Chris Christie as its national co-chairs. Okay, yeah. So, so like, that's what I read. Yeah, that could just mean that the different like, there's all different people are in this shit. All different people on the board. So I don't know, but we'll have to find out more about that. Yeah, I got to find out, and, and I should be able to find more out on that next week. So next time we can talk about it in uh, great detail. This but, whole, by the way, though, I have to say. Like, I'm a huge fan of the electoral system because I think the electoral system planted ahead of time for groupthink and the ability for large groups of people to fall into the same type of thought, right? And so it has its downsides because sometimes, you know, you can have... Well, it's hard to understand. It for, is. For your, for your, you know, your average um, just politically kind of with it person, um, it's even hard to understand. You, you really have to be... Um, even the delegates don't understand, you know, and I, I've I've learned that from interviews, you know, uh, talking to them. But but I really would like a system that 
is really, I guess, universally easier yes. for people to understand. That's all. Oh, because I don't people ag- can't understand, like, oh, shit, he beat him in the in the popular vote, but he lost the election. And, and that there is a very good reason for that. But I would love for for a better, you know, maybe maybe um, electoral vote for dummies. I, I don't know, dude. To be clear, right? I am a hundred percent on your side. The yeah. actual system where they put it into place yeah. is is bonkers. Yeah, it's, it's not horrible. good. It's not like, great. Like to, there's and people don't even know this. I don't even understand it all the way. There's I, like I don't get people it. who cast the actual vote. That was the whole thing with like January six or yes. whatever. They were yes. certifying after there was a yes. December fourth. I don't know fucking any of that. No, I agree. That part's fucked up. I'm saying the idea itself seems good the thing that i that i have very little understanding about but that some people will raise with me and they'll ask the question that i'm like i I really should look at that more is the whole redistricting thing because that's what they're talking about here absolutely like and and i'm you know the guy dan crenshaw down in texas gets a lot of shit about it now i think that guy's kind of cool like he's a cool dude yeah and he's a good person he he was a veteran and everything and like he seems to kind of get it like he's with it a little more he seems like a more moderate-ish republican in some ways i don't know some people might call me out for that but he seems like a good kind of guy that said one of the things and this is not his fault because he didn't do this but like his district which i believe goes around houston have you ever seen this no it's like it's like cutting a needle through a haystack they basically drew this weird squiggly shape i want to pull it up actually dan crenshaw and i'll put it in the corner of the screen yeah it's they this has to do with like how they redistrict stuff but if you look at it, it's like this weird squiggly line. Here it is right here. Look at that. Like, how the fuck does that work? He basically drew, like, the bottom of Mexico, <laughs> like, like around Houston so that you wouldn't get, like, all the diaspora that, quote unquote, wouldn't vote in that direction. This is the stuff that when people are saying the system is fucked up, this is where I'm like, they're right. Absolutely, you know, makes no sense. Not his fault, but he's, you know, he ripped, he reaped the rewards of that. Yep. So, you know, he's going to get shit for it. I don't yep. get it. Yep. So I guess that's what Pompeo and Yeah, I guess Christine they're trying to figure know. it out, you know, and uh, hopefully they do. Hopefully they do before he's, you know, makes this run. I mean, obviously we talked a little bit about his, his weight loss and he looks fantastic. And, um, you know, I'm excited to see him next week. Yeah, he dropped, I'd say he dropped 30, 40 pounds. He looked fantastic. And um, I would love, love to see him make a run. Um, I'll be supporting uh, financially and I'll, you know, hold whatever in my town um, to make sure that we, we get him as much as we can. I'm just not sure that we can raise that money. He can raise that money. So, That's the key, you know. And he's, listen, here's this, we, we talked about this in the past, right? The, the separation piece is pretty easy for him, right? So as a West Pointer, we, regardless of our feelings towards – um, authority, which I am terrible at. Uh, I'm, I'm not the best at, but I still understand when the mission is is dictated and the objective is clear and defined and legal, uh, we salute and and we move forward, which is what Mike did, you know. And um, and if you don't believe that, I, I hate to, I don't want to listen. I'm not even going to talk about that guy's book because it doesn't make sense. But what um, book? You know that that book we were talking about before with which the transcripts, one? with the transscripts, the discussions. Oh, between, the Woodward book. Yeah, yeah. Oh, because he was in that. Yeah, that was and, the one where they got the transcripts of, yeah, of Trump's it's, time and all. It's well done. You know, it's well done with regards to that. Don't listen to the narrative, but it's fantastic on the transcripts because you get access to that stuff. But, you know, I think for, for me, um, I, I kind of look at the system and I say to myself, um, Mike is in a position to really separate himself. And he's doing a really good job. I was worried up front with regards to his, you know, his views on religion and different things. But he's really done a fantastic job. Whoever he's got working with him are, are marvelous. Um, two things. So as a West Pointer, you could salute and say, it's my boss and I'm going to do what I'm told to do as long as it's legal, right? Which he didn't always do. He didn't always do. The second piece is think about his international accomplishments. It's significant. He's done a lot more than most secretaries of state have done. You know, significant travel, significant bringing people to the table. And I, and I was chuckling, you know, because I'm thinking about a quote from my old boss, you know, General Schwarzkopf, who, who they just published again. And, and it was a fantastic- You worked for Schwarzkopf? Yeah, years ago, during the, during the Gulf, right? So during the Gulf, we, we all did. You know, we all did. So I was on many flights with him and, um, you know, helping out with one of his assistants, you know, as, as an aide. Um, but ultimately, if you think about 
Um, and his quote is pretty pretty significant. Somebody asked him, and it, it, it kind of relates to the whole Afghanistan piece that we just kind of experienced. But somebody we'll, we'll asked him that. what his feelings were with regards to those, you know, the Republican Guard and those people, and you know what, in fact, his judgment was against those people. And he said, quite simply, he said, "Listen, um, that is not." our job that's god's job he goes we are just tasked with arranging the meeting mm -hmm. and i thought that was terrific and it kind of goes towards um you know some of the things that mike did to to bring people to the table that we have not been able to bring to the table in many years now keep your friends close and your enemies closer right we learned that at west point you know, truly. You learn that West War. Pointer and the, the Godfather. The art, well, that too. You're but, naming, but, you're, you're naming so, the Godfather so kinda, and Sun Tzu right now. Sun Tzu. So <laughs> Sun Tzu, Sun Tzu basically talks about that, right? I mean, that's kind of the first, that's the art of war. It is. Um, you know, the, the, the known is a lot less scarier than the unknown, right? So it's all about that. And it goes back to even my, my, my fight against, um, you know, both overseas and, and domestically with regards to terrorism, you know, and, and we talked about that a bunch last time. You know, so my, my thought is always um, the guy, his his contributions, besides being one of the smartest people I know, his contributions are being able to, to set an agenda and follow through on the agenda. Now, um, depends on who you're working for, but he won't be he wouldn't be working for anybody if he makes, you know, if, he, if he's elected and he should be elected. First, first um, thing to say here that's yeah. important or ask. I don't know if you yeah. know. Does any of it matter if Trump decides he's running? I don't think so. I don't think so. So you you think that if Trump says he's running, all these guys, including Mike, are just going to be like, okay, and they're going to let him run? No. Oh, you think they're going to challenge him? One hundred percent. My personal thought. I, hope I don't you, know. I, I don't I know right. anything. I hope you're right about but, that. You know, you got guys like DeSantis, you got guys like Pompeo, and you got women like uh, Nikki Haley. You, you Nikki got Haley's got no shot. She, well, says, she says whatever she needs to do to win. She, she's 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 a but, flip flop flipper. But she'd be a no, she'd be a no great shot. she'd be a great combatant for what she's got is no in the White shot. House now. Right? She's got no shot. I don't know zero percent. I, I like her. I think she knows what she's she doing. She says whatever the fuck she well, wants. Well, they all do, right? They, they all, all do they to all an extent. Do. You're they right. all do except Trump. That's why he was hated. Um, and, and listen, I have a yeah. lot of views. I have a lot okay. of different views on him too. You know, I'm no I'm no fan. I'm no fan. But at the same time, I think he loves America. You know, uh, I'll agree. But is he crazy? Absolutely, one hundred percent yes. fucking crazy. And nuts. you had close friends working. You had Pompeo. He's nuts. You He's had nuts. who was? Uh, you had the defense. Mark everything. Esper. Yeah, that's right. You know, uh, Oleg Breck Buell, uh Brian Bilotow, You know, guys up and down the administration. Dave so, Urban. Dave Urban, who's credited with putting Trump in the White House, winning Pennsylvania. Um, a dear friend. So you know, all I, serving on the Johnny Mac Soldier Sport Fund board. You know, together. So. Urban now, we know what Urban's doing now. I was going right? to say, that's, so that's our boy Mr. Urb, Mr. Urban is uh, a big-time C-sweeter at TikTok. Please leave this podcast alone. Thank you. That's a public service announcement from Jim DiOrio. That a public service announcement. Um, Dave, thank you. Dave, do it. Um, so we've talked before. Um, bottom line is, I think that I, I would be extremely excited about the next 15 years for my grandchildren um, should Mike have a legitimate chance. I, I have some views with regards to other things that I'm just really nervous knowing what I know and what I've done in the past. I'm kind of nervous about where we're headed. It makes me nervous, you know, and it, it shows right up in our day to day lives. You know, it does. I'm not saying it's anybody's fault, but it's just the way it is. What so, kinds of things? So figure it out. I mean, shit like unemployment, you know, I mean, stuff, Cost of goods, not being mm, able to cost, yeah. that, that's that's third world country problems. It's not America problem. It's not American problems. It it's now. never been. It is. I mean, you know, you, I, I know we, we're joking around, but going back to the Jersey Mike's thing, like I had to make my son did a great job making a concerted effort to keep employees. They're high school kids, right from this area. Some of the best kids I've ever met, and he established a team in order to keep. There, there's restaurants right next to us in the same strip mall that can't keep an employee. Yeah, they can't. They don't have an incentive to hire. Them. No incentive, except you know, we team culture. How you how you move things forward. It's the same. It's the same piece that's out there. Um, you know, let's let's think about these container ships that are sitting off coasts. It's it's real. It's real. I had a woman, a good friend yesterday. She flies, you know, rich people problems, right? But she flies back and forth to Nantucket with her private <laughs> pilot, right? Vineyard, but I like her. 
I like her, right? I mean, I think she's funny as hell. And um, she said, look, my biggest concern, you know, from her in in her jet, you know, sipping on her <laughs> champagne um, with her Starbucks is that, in fact, uh, she could see, you know, 15 or 20 container ships outside of Port, you know, Newark. Can you explain how this is happening and what, I like, wish... what that's caused by and why All right, they're so the sitting joke there? Is, the joke is the Suez Canal, right? You can go back to the Suez, but, but it's that's just a joke. That's just a what, joke. Wait, what is that joke? You know, remember when the Suez Canal was kind of blocked off and everybody's yes. like, oh, Suez Canal, yes. we can't get this, we can't get that. BS, right? I, but it's at every level. It's at every single level of your life, there's an issue. Us, right? Take, take it at the, the, the ground, the grassroots level of uh, food service. Our produce, just our lettuce, tomatoes, and onions have doubled in the last month, the price. It's called inflation. I mean, it's not a, just the supply chain. It is it's partially not just the, the supply chain. Partially it's the called inflation, chain. too. No, no doubt. It's definitely part, you know, the gas prices, the unemployment, the, the um, you know, the infrastructure bills and, and the unemployment bills that were put into place in order to rebuild and do whatever. Just it never works. History says that stuff doesn't work, right? So we are now suffering in every which way. I mean, college costs are, are significantly different in the last three months. I only know because I'm... Dealing with a senior. Everything is. Everything's crazy, right? So no, there's no, I don't blame anybody, but we need to do something about it. We need somebody that's going to address it. And I just don't know if there's, if that person exists, but if anybody can do it, I have full faith in my buddy. So here's, here. there's a lot to pick off here. And I, and I want to make sure we get to several different things in here because yeah, like this. Post this, Malone. Th I this just is, saw him. Love that guy. You just saw him again? I just saw him right there. Oh, on here, yeah. Love him. Yeah, love that dude. Post he's the awesome. best. But smartest, like, he should be president. He's the smartest guy I know. Honestly, like he he's- Smart dude. I, I'm not going to go there, but he's like very- People don't know a lot about like Smart how dude. he thinks about stuff. He's very historically aware. Incredibly historically Smart aware. Smart dude. Um, Unowned. Great guy to, greatest guy I worked for yet to date. Yeah, I loved, I loved when I heard Big that fan. from you. Big that, fan. Because I, I remember that conversation- where you were going to do that like that weekend and there were a few different guys there and you were like, oh, I got this fucking Post Malone. Oh, and I'm I like, was, I'm thinking to myself, like, I'm like, all right, here's Jim, Mr. Like West Point, FBI, cleaned up at every level. We got Post Malone, tattoos all over his body, Bud Light and cigarette. I know what he's going to be thinking, but I'm a huge fan. I think he's really cool. And I was like, Jim, just give him a chance. And you're like, and okay. And you did. And then you're like, oh, he's fucking awesome. Great, greatest guy. Greatest guy. That's amazing. Greatest guy. Like that. Is the best compliment he can like you and him run into each other in an Smart airport. Dude. You're not saying anything to him at first. You know uh, exactly. what I mean? I'm actually probably running him. <laughs> yeah, you're probably, probably running his name. Him. Probably doing a little Irish scan <laughs> for my old agency. My old agency. But anyway, um, back back to Pompeo because I I don't want to get off this. Yeah. So a few different things. Number one, on the Trump thing, I hope you're right about that. I think that we would be much better off if if Trump just. Called it a day. I think I, he's being convinced that it doesn't make sense. Let's to put it run? That way. To run. He keeps on saying he's going to well, run. of course. He keeps on saying everything. He's started truth. Yeah, whatever the fuck I mean, that please. Is. I, look, I, I hope you're right. I just don't... I try to read the tea leaves here, and his biggest downfall is his ego. And his ego is he's doing all these fucking rallies. He's he's talking to all these people. He's playing off all, all the points that people love him for, like his base, quote unquote. And he's going around and branding himself, which is what he does. So, of course, people who hate him are going to continue hating him. Yeah. But there are also a lot of people in this country, and I'm sensing this wave, that they're just so pissed off about how things are going now. And I see it among like a lot of my liberal friends where they're going to vote for anyone on the other side, I think, including him. If this shit continues the way it is with society, like you pointed out all these problems, but just think about regular interpersonal society and right. what they're still trying to shove down our throats with right. Dr. Anthony fuck brains over there and all this shit. I, I really hate that guy. I can't dude, dude, fucking listen, stand him. Listen, there's but, a case for treason, but we'll leave it at that. Dude, he, I, I, did you see what he did to those dogs? Yeah. What, what he funded to do yeah. those dogs? Yeah. There's a case for treason. Th if anyone defends I, I'm him at this that. point, you're a, you're a fucking moron. There's a case, I, I don't for, know what there's a case for treason. But anyway, we'll I, save that for another day. I purposely don't talk about him on this podcast because I dislike. I, it's not healthy. Like, and and I don't want those vibes out there. But anyway, we'll leave that there. Like, you look at all this stuff, and there are a lot of people who they're they're feeling desperate. 
and and you know the bills are piling up and and money's not worth much and and we still have a long way to go but i am really starting to look at this and going holy shit could we see a fucking 12 year run of this where it's just like we get four more and he's in office and we got to deal with that every day? I think that would be very bad for our country, regardless of people listening, regardless of your political beliefs. I'm not saying that Biden's good. It has not been great. It really hasn't. It wasn't first few months. It like wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. And then it just took a dump after Afghanistan. But mm. like, I just don't like if you're going to run someone else, if you're a Republican, run somebody else. Right. Because to and, and that's that's wishful thinking on my part. I think because I don't think that's going to happen. I think I think he's going to be the guy to do it. Well, listen, I respect your opinion on that, but I, I don't think so. Hope you're right. I don't think so. You know, and I think you're right. I mean, I think you hit a great point with regards to how people are feeling. You know, bills are piling up. There's distractions all over the place. There, it's it's not it's not the America that um, we all have become used to, and and. In spite of the fact that we came used became used to it, we still had reasonable complaints and disagreements, and it was all good. Now we're at the point where we're almost forced to to live a different life because we just can't feel good day to day about what's going on and things that are happening. So you know, I encourage, like I try, and I'm not the best at it, but I try to stay you know active and clear headed. And it kind of helps, you know, it kind of definitely helps with regards to being open to more things. It doesn't make you a different person. It doesn't make you, um, you know, disloyal to your your upbringing, your culture, your society, um, you know, your economic status. Your, it doesn't make you disloyal to that. You know, what it does is it allows you to be dragged out of bed in the morning. Right, and I think what's happening, and and look, we we see, and 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 mental illness affects all of us, right? We know somebody, we we've dealt with somebody, we've been around somebody, we've we've loved somebody who suffered, maybe more than one. Yes, but at the same time, it's kind of like my dad said something to me when I was a when I was a kid at at West Point. I was a freshman at West Point, and it was hard. It was just hard not. And that's a different that's a different generation. Like nowadays, I don't know how these young people do what I'd never get into West Point now. I don't know how they do what they do, but they continue to do it. But my dad something said something that really stuck with me and it works like a charm and I use it to this day. He said, When you're when you're suffering the most and when you feel like there's really not much more you can do to get yourself out of a feeling, whether it be Man, this is, you know, this is disappointing, whether it be I failed this test, whether it be I can't get a job, whether it be I'm not happy with what I'm doing. He said, get your ass up and go help somebody else. Mm. It doesn't have to be a big thing. You know, get up and go help somebody else. And that could just be a phone call. Mm. You know, a perfect example is today. I haven't talked to a guy, and we were talking about this a little bit before. I haven't talked to a childhood friend in probably 40 years. Probably 40 years. And I just found out through a mutual friend that his dad passed away. And his dad was my first Little League baseball coach. A really impactful guy in my life. Larger than life guy. And I just picked up the phone and I called this guy. And he said to me, you know what? I was not going to pick up the call because I, I don't recognize. If I don't recognize the number, I don't pick it up. He's a, he's, a, mm -hmm. he's a wealth management guy, right? And we started talking about his dad, and we were laughing, and he said, Jimmy, I'm going to use that story that you just told me about my dad in, in the eulogy tomorrow. What story? So th this is great. You'll, you'll lo love this. And this, this kind of – Oh, you, told, you called him and told him a story. I told him a story. Mm -hmm. So this kind of personifies like this guy, right? So a typical great Jersey, you know, larger-than-life figure, um, Paisan, right? So – I'm pitching. I'm terrible, right? I, I, it's funny that I went on to play baseball at West Point, but I was terrible at the time as a pitcher. I just wanted to play third base and hit. That's this, it. This high school. This is this is this is nine and ten year old baseball. Oh, literally, right? So anyway, I get, um, you know, I get the ticket. He, Mr. Mr. Papa says you're pitching today. I'm pitching today. I'm so, Mr. Papa. I don't know. Get out there and pitch. Go out and pitch. So I get out there in the first inning. I throw, you know, a couple of strikes and, and you know, I get a couple kids out. Uh, I have a good first inning. Second inning, I come back out. I walk two kids, and the best hitter in town is coming up to the plate. 
So Mr. Papa strolls. I calls the time. Time out. Time out. You know, he comes walking Does out. Does he walk like this? Walking out. Hey, hey, don't. You know, whatever. He comes <laughs> out there. Hey, listen, kid. What do you think we should throw this guy? You know? So I said, well, I, I, I throw him the fastball. <laughs> kid, we don't throw him the fastball. He said, we throw him the curveball. Throw him the curveball. All right. So I just, okay. Yeah, I'll throw, I'll throw him the curveball. Oh, Jesus Christ. So, I throw a fastball right down the middle. It's at about seven miles, right? So we go down, you know, we're down three nothing right out of the box. So we get out of the inning the rest of the way. I come back and I goes, what did I tell you? I said, well, you said to, to throw him the curveball. He said, well, why didn't you do that? I said, because I don't know how to throw a curveball. <laughs> and so he said to me, next time X. <laughs> So I said, okay. So I told my buddy that story the today. X is phenomenal. It's great. So I told my buddy that today, and it, it brightened his day. But for me, I was kind of having a, well, I got to find this next location for Jersey. I'm running around. like, blah, 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 blah. And that centered me, help out somebody. And, and it was nothing more than telling this guy a story that he didn't know about his dad as his 81-year-old father passed and lived a great life and passed. And I just... I winked up at my dad, who I know is in heaven, and, and I said, it still works. It still works, Pop. Thank you. You know? And that, I think that's one thing we can, however we do that, whether it be encouraging somebody that needs that encouragement or being kind to somebody or holding a fucking door, you know, or giving them, listening to a story that you really don't feel like listening to, you know? Like, I had a, a vet walk into the store today, a Vietnam vet, and you know, the kids are like, oh, this guy talks for, you know, telling me, oh, Mr. D, you got caught. You know, Big Jim, you got caught. Uh, he's the guy's going to talk for, well, I tell you, the guy talked for an hour. It was, it was probably, I relate to it because what he was telling me yeah. about, you know, um, the fact that he fired in Vietnam, fired 155 howitzers and 105 howitzers, that was all me. I, I remember that stuff. So he just, it was beautiful. And at the end of it, you know, I, he had his sub, he had his, his, his giant sub he was carrying out and. And I said, you and you know, you and the wife gonna eat well tonight. He said, No, nah, this is this is two nights of dinner. So I knew right away. So I said, When did she pass? Tell me your name. Mm. Talk to me about her. And he told some stories, and then he told a couple more stories about growing up in Jersey City, and you know, being around during the, the '67 riots, and and all those all those things that brought back for me something that I was in the circle of, you know, and. The kids afterwards said, "Wow, you were laughing, and he was laughing, and you I've relate. never seen him." I related, yeah. and and I I think like not to take any credit at all for me, but but it it continues to be that cycle. And the kids watch, and one of the boys, uh, you know, Washington Township local kid, just graduated last year. He's going to Rowan. He he looked at me, Mr. Day. I'm going to do that next time. Like I'm going I'm going to talk to a guy. Yeah, you should. It's a good feeling, you know, and. I think that we don't have enough of that right now and what's going on. We're all worried about uh, Biden's doing this and she's doing that and this guy's going to run it. And that's important stuff. We need to talk about that because mm. it's critical. But at the same time, let's not forget about the things we can do to help each other out. You know, I, I vaguely know how we got there, but I don't fully know. Tell but me, I'm I, interested. No, I, I like when this kind of shit happens because stuff like that was a great story to tell those two to put it in perspective a bit. And I understand what you're saying because – at a, however we got there at a high level it does tie into you know prime example somebody who was in vietnam yes you personally relate but i mean there's probably a few interesting stories in there but like the 18 year old kids 17 year old kids working for you they're not trained to think like that right now no. there's there's very little and i don't think it's their fault because i can't imagine being a kid while this era has happened right here but Agreed. there's very little mental preparation for the world and people and how things connect and stuff like that. And I, I don't want to go totally off down a tangent, but when we're talking about politicians, period, it usually, especially with me, it starts with just a ton of like sideswiping them and, and talking about how shitty they all are and everything. <laughs> so I do true. understand it's an important conversation to have. So we have it on here, but you know, Talking about your boy, Pompeo, look, there, there are going to be people who say the obvious, and this is fine, by the way. There's nothing wrong with this. Like, people that call this kind of shit out are stupid, where they're like, okay, well, it's your buddy, your roommate's with him, your best friend's with him. Of course, that's who you're going to back. Like, fuck yeah, you, you can't I understand see that. It. We'll still talk about it in the open. Yeah. Because obviously, like, 
I've been open about the fact that I, I don't have a political home here. I have a ton of issues with with the two sides here. I think right now, you know, we have the presidency in office. What we're seeing kind of speaks for itself. I can make the case there as to why there's been a lot of issues. I also don't think it was right to run him. I don't think he wants to be there. I think mm -hmm. he's old. I think it's unfair. Whatever. When I look at the other side, I hope you're right that it's not Trump who comes up, but I, I don't love the options there. And like with Pompeo, I, I want to be very nuanced in how I say this, and this is very, very important. We're now at a point where people make assumptions on everyone, including military members, mm -hmm. who who may even may or may not get into politics, but at least talk about it somewhere. But then maybe they run and stuff like that. And people are like, they're people who are on the left will now rip them because they're like, oh, they're in the military, they must be conservative. And that's not a total. There's not a lot of people doing that, but I see some of that, and it's mm -hmm. like that. That's not fair. I try to separate the two things. I try to respect what they what they've done and you know given your life to the country and everything I have a very high regard for that provided you do it in in the right ways and then I also try to separate that from what they want to do to mm. use that platform and so like with Mike Pompeo there are a few things that I think I empathize with his position, but I firmly disagree. And I'd like to explain this. I want to give sure. it the full context so that you can have everything to pick off the bone. And yep. it's not just like I'm, I'm fucking around here. One of the first things that comes to mind is the guy on my mug here, Edward Snowden. I think that we totally missed the boat there with what he tried to do. I think that his story is so difficult to imagine yourself in that position, but the very... Cliff Notes version of it is this guy had everything to lose. He had been in the agencies. He had a cushy job with the NSA in Hawaii. He was about to marry the love of his life, living in fucking Hawaii. He had everything to lose. And he chose to do this and, and ruin his life in a mm -hmm. lot of ways. He's fucking living. I mean, that, there's no one who's got more free time than that guy living yep. in, his, in his place in Russia. And by the way, like rips the Russian government living in Russia. You yep. want to talk about a guy who puts money where his mouth is. Yep. Like that's like biting the fan that the hand it feeds you, but whatever. You know, I guess Putin's like putting up with it. Anyway, I understand where a guy like Mike Pompeo comes from because he's not just military, he's West Point. Mm -hmm. And one of uh, there's a lot of important things, respect, diligence, all that all that stuff. But when when you look at the military, if I think if there's one thing that is the most important part of it, it's the chain of command because it comes down to organization and keeping the objective on task. And as the military, it's a life or death kind of thing. Now, some, Agreed. Yeah, I, I don't know if like you may find some other things because you were in it, but from the outside, at the very least, that's one of the most important I, things. I agree. It's a systems piece. Okay. Yep. So with Edward Snowden, I also have a great appreciation for slippery slopes and so does he. And that's why it took him a while to even go do this. And that's why he did it carefully because no matter what he did, it was a slippery slope. He had tried to raise the issue and people were poo-pooing him. And it was at a point where now and we could talk about the whole like government forces and shit, but he was going to get – you weren't going to see him again mm -hmm. if he kept pushing it. But the contrary point was that if he wasn't going to push it internally, he'd have to push it externally. And so what is he doing when he does that? He's breaking the chain of command. He's releasing material information that he did sign a page before his career to say he wasn't going to do this. Yep. And there was a risk to it. And so there are things that could be charged to him. Now, it's worth noting, not a single person died as a result of his leaks because he did it so fucking carefully. However, despite that slippery slope, I think he made the right decision because I know he made the right – that's my opinion. Yeah, People can disagree. but. He went out there and he was like, all these things have now happened for 10, 11 years post 9-11, and no one's raising the issue and it's getting worse. This is what happens when a big group, a powerful group, the government in this case, in the know, people who are unelected, often behind the scenes actually executing this stuff, this is what happens when you let it go. So he revealed Stellar Wind. He revealed that the government was essentially spying on its citizens. Now, right away... There are people who are like, I don't fucking care if the government looks at what I have to do. I have nothing to hide. Sure. What about the slippery slope of that, though? What about when the government has so much power that they can now, in a coronavirus period, hold you in your home because they know you're not there? 
And it's it, that's actually easy to spot because the iPhones, once we got that, you can spot that kind right. of shit. But think about how much farther they can take that. They can watch you in your home through a fucking camera. They could do this back then mm. when he was releasing this. They've been doing it for years. And so this guy comes out and tries to say it. And Mike Pompeo, whose life is about chain of command, respect, order. You know, as I haven't seen him change his opinion publicly, I'd be open if he did. But he talked about he wanted this guy executed. And to me, I'm like, okay, I empathize with where you're coming from. High-ranking military guy, West Point. Think about this a little bit. Think about what you're saying. You are essentially saying that if the, if the government's doing it, and mind you, this is a Republican who's all about smaller government and less power to the dark forces. Well, you're, you're promoting it when you say something like that. This is a hypocritical stance to me. And so I bring all this up because now there's more attention to it again because of a, of a report that came out with Yahoo. I have it behind it, but behind us, but you and I talked about it. I just want to give a little background so people understand. This was end of September, and the title was The CIA Pitched Trump Officials Plans to Assassinate Julian Assange, who was the head of WikiLeaks, is the head of WikiLeaks, while he was hiding in a London embassy in 2017, according to this long report. It's like 3,000 words, 2,000 words. Go read it. It's very interesting. I have mixed emotions on it, but it's significant because Mike Pompeo, who was the Secretary of State, this is back in the early part of the Trump presidency when he was the head of the CIA. Mm -hmm. And so what I see here, like Julian Assange, another guy, you want to talk about free speech, open media, something again, the right side stands for right now. It's like the, their free speech movement. This is the guy doing it. Mm -hmm. And he's in a London, he's in a, he is in an ally country in a protected embassy and the report is they were talking about going in there and assassinating him now let me be fair and say pompeo did respond and to be clear he said the wikileaks report sources for the yahoo news wikileaks report should all be prosecuted i do, did he deny it Wait, hold on was based on interviews with four uh, i can't say much about this other than whoever those 30 people who allegedly spoke to one of those reporters, they should all be prosecuted for speaking about classified activity inside the Central Intelligence Agency. Okay, so he said, and then he goes on to say, when bad guys steal those secrets, we have a responsibility to go after them to prevent that from happening. We absolutely have a responsibility to respond. We desperately wanted to hold accountable those individuals that have violated U.S. law, that have violated requirements to protect information and tried to steal it. There's a deep legal framework to that, and we took cons actions consistent with U.S. law to try to achieve that. To be clear, I disagree with that statement. WikiLeaks was a source that people could provide them information, and then they are a media source that is free to share it. Same way that back in like the Bush days, and then I'm sure in the Obama days, but they don't talk about that in the media, there were stories that like the New York Times and stuff would have, and they would call up the White House and say, yo, should we run this? They'd be like, no, hold off on that. We could have avoided fucking Iraq if mm -hmm. they had just run these fucking stories. Mm -hmm. You know? So like when I see this stuff, I have an issue with it because I'm like, this is a small government Republican advocating for big government realization on situations that he thinks the little people shouldn't have to understand. Now, do I understand that there is classified intelligence that the general public should not have? Absolutely, fucking lootly, man. I'm not. Oh, it's I'm, national security. I'm not right? one of these I mean, libertarians. Who's national like, security. Yeah, no that government. Part. Fuck that. Where Agreed. I have an issue is when you start to then call someone like Julian Assange, who he should say thank you for even being in office because of that guy's leaks. Mm -hmm. When you start calling that out and start trying to say this guy is is violating U.S. laws when he's just releasing things that if you want to say someone's violating it, say Chelsea Manning's violating. Mm -hmm. You know, say the people who are giving it to him mm -hmm. are violating it. And I see that track record. I see what he said about Snowden. And it's like, I don't like that. I get it. I understand his background, but my job is not to be like, hey, because I understand your background, I'm going to totally agree with what you do because you have the credibility to do that. I still want to be able to say, hey, you're really locked in the military mindset. I get it. There's a part of that that there's a balance needs to be there, but like there's nuance to this. And now even federal federal courts have gone on to say that what Edward Snowden did was was righteous mm -hmm. he's been proven in court which mm -hmm. sometimes you can take that as you want well yeah but still anyway i wanted to get that uh, all out there because that is where a big root of my issues would come with someone like him well i understand and, and i and i appreciate you know both sides of it and i would i would separate you know i i think the thing for me and the way i think kind of um my critical thinking is is to think about 
um, the separation of of the you know the free speech piece, which everyone's entitled to, but also, um, and, and I think that's maybe where it got off. If it did get off where it should have gone, I think the difference between the right to free speech versus that um, government employee who signs off and who has that top secret or even that compartmentalized security clearance that says quite clearly, because yeah. I lived with it, you know, yes. so it says quite clearly, like, you will not X, Y, and Z. Should you do that, will you be prosecuted? Yes. Maybe. 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 You know, well, right? Actually, let but, me speak in defense of that. Yeah. That's what it says. Well, will, will yes, it does say you will be prosecuted. However, will you be prosecuted? Maybe. Maybe, right? Will you lose your pension? Definitely. <laughs> no. No? No. You know who has his pension? Robert Hansen. Come on. His no, wife, he doesn't. His wife collects his pension no, he monthly. Doesn't. Same pension I get. Yes. No, he doesn't. Yes. Tell people who Robert yes. Hansen is. He's probably the most... Um, did you know him, by the way? I did not. I, I did not know him. I probably ran across him. Um I had to have run across him, but I did not know him until, you know, it became the issue it was. I think he was a New York agent, hated it there. The whole story is he didn't want to be transferred to New York because he felt he couldn't make a, a living and couldn't support his family the way he wanted to. He was a Midwest guy, I believe, um, and ultimately he rose in the level and, and through like our counterterrorism, counterintelligence divisions and, um, you know, fought this New York thing tooth and nail. And his justification was, well, you're not going to pay me enough fucking money. I'll spy. Because they are paying me money. He spied for the spied Soviet for the Union. Russians. Yep, yep. And that was and a movie. So it was it was called a, Breach. Yeah, I think it was called Breach. Yeah, mm -hmm. about the the um, you know the support person who brought him down. Which I don't know. I, I don't know if that's accurate, but it was pretty good. You know, it's pretty well done. So so my my thought is yes. I mean, it's the same process, right? So when we go through our admin function, um, and what I mean by that is when we go through, hey, an allegation is made against Julian that says, in fact, he provided information to someone who simply wrote about it and provided factual information, right? Um, we now have to do an internal, which we should, and determine what your intent was. Yes. It's all about intent, right? And, and that goes back for me and Mike Pompeo to our honor code at West Point. A, a cadet will not lie, cheat, or steal. Here's here's the difference between Air Forces, Naval Academy, anybody else. Nor tolerate those who do. That's the difference. So why, is he, coming, not, so why is he coming out so, and execute so here's, Edward Snowden? Here's, here's part of it, right? So here's the other part of it. Intent, spirit of the code, those things. That was ingrained in us through examples, through living the life of it. And I can tell you a story about a classmate, a bunch of classmates, as freshmen at West Point, sitting around after first semester and discussing GPAs. And it was very open there because you could say what you wanted to say or make believe that you did better or worse than you did. Ultimately, it was posted. They don't do that anymore because they send it to your computer. Let's post it in what we call our Sally Port area where you come out for parades that are kind of the circular, you know, tunnels that the barracks sit above. And it would be posted, Diorio, Calculus 101, A minus, <laughs> you know, and all your grades for your tests and your quizzes and your class participation. Damn. Right? So – there was no hiding from it. We'll, we'll take it. We, we go past first semester. There's probably a 10 or 15 of us, all of my best buddies now, sitting around in a room. And, it, and we go around. Hey, what'd you, Diorio, what'd you get, you know, this semester? Oh, I got a 2.6. Okay. What'd you get? Oh, I got a 2.8. Right. So it goes around to everybody and everybody's between. And, and the funniest thing is kind of like the number 10, 15 in your class is probably like a 3.2. Right. Because it's so difficult. Yeah. The, wow. And. Now it's more the entitled generation, so they want to see the 4.33, so they, everybody gets it because, you know, you, you get a trophy for being seventh place. Anyway, um, so uh, – not true. But, I, don't, but, I don't disagree with you uh, at all. So take it – it goes around the room, and it gets to the last guy, and I can remember this. And, and the last guy was a 4.0, right? But he says 2.9. And why does he say that? And to this day, we know why he's turned in. 
So he gets a note from the honor board and remember no computers, no emails. He gets a written note on his door, right? You got an honor board, which means you go up in front of investigators basically who are cadets mm -hmm. that determine what? Your intent. Not what you lied about or not that you lied. What was your intent? Wait. Now Listen, I, so right, I'm going to run it out, right? So I don't follow. When they asked him, cadet so-and-so, you lied about your GPA. Oh, You God, were a 4-0, okay. but you said you were a 2-9. Why? Because I didn't want everybody else to think I was a fucking dick. Mm. I didn't want to be a curved dick, which we used to call it West Point. I didn't want to be better than anybody else in that room because they're my brothers, and we're going to go fight in combat together, right? So if you think about what Pompeo may have lost along the way, because of a couple of different reasons. And Mike, Mike is one of the funniest guys I know, one of the kindest guys I know. What can be lost, and I will tell you that I had to remind myself often as the head of the FBI in, you know, in, in an office to say, what was, the, what was that guy's intent? Like, what did he hmm. intend to do by doing what he did? And I always came to a better conclusion. We might not be remembering that as much. Right. And, and I understand why, because it's, it is the most, it is the, is the most competitive kind of organ, not organization. That's a bad word. Such a competitive aura and atmosphere to where these guys, they are, they're controlling the world. Mm -hmm. They're controlling the world. Their words control the world. So I think that's a, that's my I'm defending him, you know, clearly I'm yes. defending him because he's, he's my pal. And he, and you know, we are, you know, we bled together. We're, we're going to die together, you know, but at the same time, I think we need to think about what was Snowden's intent? What was, I think that's a closed case, you, you know, I, and I, so, I, I think if they were thinking I, about that, he wouldn't be saying I that. I don't disagree. I don't disagree. What, what I think is where we do have where we do have the ability to go back. And if I were to do the investigation. Hey guys, real quick. I totally forgot to say this in the intro, so I got to make sure I hit it because, you know, I got to grow the podcast here after all. But if you're on YouTube, please make sure you hit that subscribe button. If you haven't already, hit the like button on the video as well. And thank you as always for checking out the channel. If you are listening on Apple or Spotify, thank you for checking out the show there. If you haven't already, hit that subscribe button on Apple, hit that follow button on Spotify, and I look forward to seeing you guys again for future episodes. Now, back to Jim. If I were to be the guy, and I've done it before, I would want to go to those 30, 40, 50, 80, 100, more than that, because if 30 are reported, 500 fucking did it, right? I would want to go back and say, what the fuck were you thinking? And I'm going to guarantee you 95% of them saying, well, I thought it would make me important. Make me feel, you know, make, make me the man. Because I've never been the man. I sit in this little desk and I, nobody tells me that I did a good job. And, and, and listen, woe is me, right? And all that bullshit. But that's really the case. I mean, I had intelligence analysts that just needed stroking. They were great. The, the reporting and the intel reports that they provided, nobody ever said, holy shit, this is amazing. Except I'll, me. You know what? That I'll, I know of. I'll, I'll play. I'll play right in. I don't agree. I don't agree for this case. I don't think that's at all what it was. Let's even say it was, though. You're talking about Wiki, WikiLeaks or No, or I'm not even there. I'm on Snowden right gotcha. now. We'll, we'll get back to WikiLeaks because that report is interesting. But the intent there, even if there was, like, let's say he was like, well, why the fuck am I only on this desk right here? Like, the intent still was to reveal what was happening that was, it's been proven, was illegal, by the way. I have to do this. I'm sorry I got to do this. Your good friend Jim Comey <clears throat> is actually, do you know that Stay story? calm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So he's, one compliment I'll give him. I don't know if, I, I have to tell that real quick for people to know the story. But in 2003 or 2004, yeah. John Ashcroft yes. was the attorney general. Yes. And Dick Cheney. Yes. Had been pushing through all these archaic laws yes. after the Patriot Act that were illegal. And the way it worked was the president had been given executive power, the office of the president, to instill certain initiatives after 9-11 that he could do. However, 
for the legal defense for the future, which is always a bad sign if you need that, like heavily, you wanted to get the attorney general's office to sign off on it and say, we approve that the president is going to do this before yeah. he did it. So Stellar Wind, which Snowden later exposed, this is back in 0304, Stellar Wind was coming due for its yearly signing. And so the Justice Department had been reviewing it and they had determined that this is fucking illegal. We cannot sign off on this. So John Ashcroft, unrelated, healthy guy, got it's, like I remember he's, he got he's laying like, in the hospital. Yeah, he got like pancreat like his pancreas yeah, or pancreatitis. Some, something exploded. Yeah, autoimmune pancreatitis. Yeah. Like yep. his life yep. is actually in danger. I remember. It's coming up on midnight. Dick Cheney, notice I'm saying Dick Cheney instead of George Bush, sends the guy who later became the AG, the the Latino guy, I forget his name. Oh yeah, 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 I could see his face. And then oh my god. Andy Card who was the yeah, Who was that guy? The, well, I'll pull it up in a minute. Yeah. Andy Card, who was the chief of staff at the time, he sends them to the fucking hospital, hospital. to the I re- ICU. I, re- I remember. And they're holding this page in and front Comey of is there, right? in front of Ashcroft. Jim, <laughs> you can't make this shit up. Jim Comey and Mueller, Miller, whatever the guy, the the report guy. Yeah, Jay Miller. Yeah, yep. who was the head of the FBI or, at the time? John Miller. John Miller. ABC's. No, 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 no. I'm talking about Mueller. Fucking. Um, oh, Robert. Of, Mu- yeah, Robert yeah, yeah, Mueller. Yeah, 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 Mueller. Sorry, I thought I always, you meant. I, I thought say you meant. No, there is a John Miller who was. I pronounce his name right, wrong. I'm gotcha. sorry. Yeah, it's it's. It, I always because I would always read it and yeah. say Mueller. Right. And then they'd say it the other way. Mueller, and it would yeah. Ne- yeah, it would never yeah. go in one ear out the other. Boring but, dude. But anyway, he shows up with Comey. And they look at John Ashcroft, who's on the bed. You got the White House on the other side, and they're like, John, you don't have to sign this. We know you don't agree with it, but you know, do what you want to do. And he's like, I'm not fucking signing it. Of course, the White I House- I do remember that. They still yeah. signed off on it. But I that was the that. one time they went to block it. Yep. So like Snowden, and I want to make sure I remember how we got there, but Snowden was- Well, his intent. His intent was that- that story was 2003. He was leaking, or 2004. He was leaking in, in 2013. His intent was the fact that those things, even after that, all those years later, have been allowed to grow to such an extent that it's like we're violating every constitutional principle. And mind you, mind you, this was a guy. He was like kind of conservative. Then Bush came in. Bush blue-pilled him. He's like, oh, my God, maybe Obama will save this. Obama, for whatever reason, you know, there's a lot of different things you can guess there. He just kind of keeps it going. Yeah. So now he's like, yo, fuck all these people. Yeah. He's got no allegiances. And he's like, no, we're not doing this. So he also goes, goes to the best reporters in the world to do this. Like goes to the best people in the world to like people who, who to this day, like Poitras, she didn't like the NSA. There was a little bit of bias there. I'll give that. But like you, why the fuck am I, Glenn Greenwald, sorry, I almost forgot his name. Glenn Greenwald, who's like a savage to this mm-hmm. day, just, I mean, no allegiances whatsoever, just reports the fucking news, got kicked out of his own company because he wants to report the news. Like he goes, he protects all this stuff and they release it correctly. No one dies, as I said earlier. And it's like, well, think about the intent there. If the guy, if the guy wanted to inflict damage, you're, you're dropping bodies. Mm-hmm. You're putting it out. You're, you're not meeting people in hong kong to put in this shit out you're fucking feeding it to them you're going to wikileaks that's what you're doing like wikileaks is just going to take it and put it out they're a media source in that way that's what a media source is going to do this guy this guy he he fucking protected everything and and there's going to be people people that point out like well he got on a plane with it or whatever look there's an element of risk but to me like i, I understand the scary part now is someone else can use the precedent and say, well, Snowden did it. And they can do it for something a lot less. That's scary. That's not good. I don't want I don't want to see people from the CIA coming on TV and talking about basic intelligence shit right. that the CIA does. That's right. a fucking problem. Yeah, no, now, I couldn't agree more. If they want to talk about like them and other agencies like technologically meddling with with each other and expose that, oh okay, I could see that. But like there's still an element where it's like, all right, where's there have to be evil matching evil? I get that. When it goes to affect every single person for no reason other than fear mongering and a controlled state, that's where I draw the line. And so that's why, like, I'm okay with it. And like, I, for someone like Pompeo, who is, you know, he's a Midwestern conservative kind of guy, I'm going to have a lot of disagreements with him. But like, I know personally from you, you've known him your whole life. He's, he's a, I trust your opinion yeah, very it's... much so. You tell me like it is with people. So I like that he seems like a nice guy. I just, I can't let something like that go because 
to me, it, I reward people for also shifting on opinions provided it's not for political bullshit, you know, and being like, okay, well, wait a second, let's consider this. And I would hope that he hears something about like that intent board. And be like, okay, well, what was the guy's intent? Well, that's the key, man. I, I got to tell you, uh, you know, I appreciate everything you're talking about because I think that simplifies a lot of things. Thinking about intent. What's the, what is the value to, not value, because that's a terrible word, but what is the intent? What do I mean to be, by doing this, what's my thought? Is it about me or is it about something bigger than myself? Right? Mm. And in this case, it clearly is. So you got to look at it from both sides. You know, what, what is what is the politician? What is the director? What, you know, down the line, when I was in a position of authority in a government agency, I often thought about, well, why am I doing this? Like, all right, somebody's bringing this to me. And, and there were times where I'd be like, you know what? I can, I can dig the shit out of somebody with this information. Like, I can really make somebody look like an ass. And you know my distaste for Tacomi and, and now fucking Andy McCabe lying again. But whatever, it is what it is, right? At the end of the day, um, my thought is always... And you kind of liked him, too. I do like Andy, but he did it again. But anyway... Um, you can't lie, you know, uh, you, you just can't. There's no time for it. There's no place for it. But my thought, again, my thought is I would always ground myself back to why am I, why is this upsetting me? And you know what it always came back to? It always came back to there was some type of negative core belief in me that made me feel like I wasn't deserving or wasn't good enough to be in this position. Mm. So I'm going to show you that I got, the fucking power but i never did that honestly i've i never did it i always looked and said man this is just me digging at myself you know mm -hmm. let, let's figure out why this is important right and i think that's that is a critical piece and we are missing that and i i believe as you advance into levels like directorships or um you know secretary positions you become more susceptible to thinking, well, man, maybe I am. And I'm not saying this about anybody in particular. Maybe I am really great. Yes. But no, you're that's not. an important thing for you to say. But you're not. Yeah. You know, at the end of the day, if you are a true patriot, we have plenty mm. of them on both sides of the aisle. Plenty of them. Yes. Right? Be that, be that guy. You know, I can remember, we talked about this last time. I remember a mobster looking at me and saying, I respect you because you do your job. And, you know, if you're going to be a bear, be a fucking grizzly. Right. And that is the same kind of piece that I feel people in those, you know, the rest of us that are lay people that are out here doing their thing. Yeah, you think about a lot about, um, you know, how does this benefit my legacy and my legacy being children or family or things that are important or safety, right? Just safety and health. But at the same time, you still have the thought, why am I doing, you know, wait a minute, is this something trying to prove something more than I really need to prove? Like mm. people already think I'm, you know, not think, but people buy in, you know, um, you know, it, it goes back to Sheila's deceased husband, right? Jimmy Martello. This guy's credo was very simple. You know, very, 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 if it needs to be done, do it. If it needs to be given, give it. If it needs to be loved, love it. Period. There's no, no, nowhere in there is there because <laughs> if you do it, people will say, fuck that. You know, it's that simple. So I think it's the same, you know, and, and listen, we're, we're really, we're going 40,000 feet on this thing. And yeah, looking down. No, this is interesting. But, but at the end of the day, like, that's my thought. And, and I want to, I, I got to tell a story because we talked about this last time. You know, we talked about Chris Morgan, right? And CJ Morgan, the young cadet who was oh, killed yeah. in an accident, right? And I got to tell you, you know, we've talked about this off, but I'm going to talk about it now, right? What you did for that family by doing what you did and putting together the clip with regards to CJ. And we talked about this, but I get a call shortly after. Can you tell people what that was? Yeah, to, so to... so CJ, CJ Morgan's the young man who was killed in a, in a rollover car accident at West Point, like we talked about before, just sitting in the wrong seat, period. Yeah. So, so Chris and April, who have three other kids, lose their oldest son. He's killed. He was a senior, right? He's a senior at West Point. The world in front of him, Great wrestler, Chicago-born, West Orange-raised, African-American male, one of the kindest people because the family is tremendous, um, what they do and how they do it today, still today, having lost, he buried his son, right? 
Um, his, his dad's in the Secret Service. His too, dad right? is retired Secret Service, right? So, so anyway, I don't know any of this. When we talk about that, it's just an emotional time because you and I, you know, we we relate to to those sacrifices, you know, and ultimately we let it go. And you release this thing. You didn't the have any timeline. The, the short TikTok, thirty second, right? And you don't, you don't, we don't, we don't talk about time. We don't talk about any of that. It just releases. I'm I didn't driving. tell you it was coming. You didn't. Yeah. You know, and I watch it and people are calling me like, dude, this thing is blowing up, whatever. His high school wrestling coach calls me, and you know this because you talk to him. And he says, I want to tell you a story. He said about a week ago, Mrs. Morgan, April, was struggling. And I, if she's listening, you know, I want her to know how much I love and respect her and her family. And everybody struggles because I watch it with my wife, my wife who lost her husband in the towers. I get it. People struggle, right? But it's how they come out of it. You know, it's some, I think Rose Kennedy once said, it's not what happens to you. It's how you handle it. Right. So same kind of thing. Look at me talking about a Democrat. Anyway. Um, You're so honest. I love that. So ultimately what, what happens is he says to me, she was struggling, right? She thought everybody forgot. Everybody's going to forget about CJ. That's it. Everybody. And then your clip pops. And she said, I can't believe it. I can't believe this happened. It's a, it's a sign. They it's were something from on, CJ. They were working on the golf tournament, right? Working no on making, you know, raising some money and, hey, can you please, we're trying to do, we're trying to make this a little bigger and, and everything. And everybody's kind of like, ah, oh, yeah, it's great. You know, and, and time rolls on. And well, you right. know what I know it, you know, it doesn't matter. People go about their lives and they should go about their lives, right? But just at a time when that wonderful woman needs just a little something to say, we still got your back. You do that for her. And this has been the most successful year for them fundraising. And they're going to get to that next level and things they want to do in their son's name, who, who was an amazing person, right? So I just want to say, like, this is a – I get so many compliments for the way you handle yourself. And, hey, and that's why I, that's why I choose to come back on because we're, we're, we're friends and we'll always be friends. But it doesn't mean that I would say, oh, yeah. And, you know, we struggled getting me on, right, for a long time. Now, you didn't want to do it. Now you're not, not going to be able to get me off. I had to talk shit. I had you to, did. I'll never tell that you had story. It, I had you, to talk no, mad shit on mad shit. to get him on here. And it worked, right? So, But you want to talk about impact? You want to talk about the importance of what you're doing and how you're doing it? You basically lifted up a family that had thought the world might have just might have just slipped their mind for a minute about their son and to me and to the wrestling coach and to the people that listened and are listening you know we just i, I just want to commend you on on this and, and that just tells me why you're going to be beyond successful in what you're doing but also that you found already the formula to make an impact on people, on truly people. And and that is intentional or unintentional. And we're talking about intent, but but God damn, this is really good. So I want to call, you know, I just want to make sure people understand that. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if there's like right words to respond at or and thank you. And that's an unbelievable compliment coming from you. And I, I appreciate that beyond measure. But also with that like specific instance, because obviously you, you called me right after that happened. And you kind of filled it in there. But just to be totally clear, that was a it was a regular TikTok clip I put out on a Sunday. And there were great highlights from our last episode. So I was making some and I made that one. And, you know, when I make this stuff, yeah, there there's a self-serving aspect to it. I put out all different types of content because all different types of things happen in here with all sure. different types of people. And I'm promoting the podcast to try to grow podcasts, which is a crazy thing to try to start with how many there are in the world. But with the TikTok clips, I will say, I take them so seriously, man, from every level. I At this point with the style I do, I never ever spend less than eight hours making a good clip. And most of them are, are towards 12. But when it's something very heavy in here, particularly something where it's not me saying it and it's the other person saying it, it's the guest in here saying it, like they're trusting me to give them the right outlet here to share some things. And I'm amazed at what people share. But 
I was going through, that was a Saturday night. I was making that like late at night and I was going through and I was trying to find it. And I saw this spot and I'm like, cause the way you put it was so direct and like straight to the point. Like it this was not a long story. You had a tangent in the middle where you gave like a little bit of color that mm -hmm. didn't matter for a clip, mm -hmm. but like, you're like this kid, I didn't know him. I had actually seen him at a wrestling meet when he was wrestling was so impressed by him, but never talked with him. And then he dies in this tragic accident. Here's what happened. I'm talking with his father, though, who's like this unbelievable guy. And he just lost his kid, just buried his son. I can't imagine that. And he's like, what was the exact line? He's like, we was, for now, for now, we live our lives and remember his. And the, we'll see him again. The way you said it. And then there was a good one, 1,000, two, 1,000. And you're like almost in tears. And then you're just like, fuck. Because I see you like as a father right there trying to even try to imagine that. And it's like, you, you can't. And I can't. felt that shit. And so on that one, when I have a clip like that, when I have a clip like Ashton Larrell's clip where he's talking about almost committing suicide, you're goddamn right I take that a little extra seriously. So I actually made your clip way quicker because it was so perfect and the timing was perfect. It came together fast, maybe within like an hour. Mm -hmm. I must have spent six hours just getting the right piano on that to get it right. And all of it's for like, hey, I want people to feel this. Not Absolutely. just whether they knew him or not, which yeah. is, by the way, that was a phenomenal benefit. I never expect that, but I guess it worked out that way where it a lot did. of people he knew saw that. And loved but it. But it's like, you put that out because you shared that. It was an emotional thing for you. And like, I can't imagine being that family and I want it represented in the perfect way. And so when it then goes out there and not only accomplishes that, but comes back to where it fucking filled out their golf outing and got their foundation that she was worried, his mother was worried that people were already forgetting about because, you know, life goes on and, and it's that's what it's happens reality. it's it's unfair yeah. it's very it's unfair mean. but it's true but it's not it it's it, it's a scary thing too because like as a parent you want your son's legacy to live on see to see a small thing like that catalyze the community first of all you did it because it was you that said it i'm glad i could be the outlet to put it together but i i didn't know what to say to that man because it touched me so much and on on a personal note you know, it can be a very frustrating process building something like this. I don't have a life. I, I, I used to have a great one. So I guess, you know, that's how life works. I had a great one for <laughs> Still a long do, time. Man. But, yeah. you know, I, I sit here and, and I'm trying to grow this thing. And it can be tough when you have setbacks that are out of your control. And, you know, people might not see some things that you see that people say in here that I'm like, oh, that was awesome. And then other people, they don't even notice it. It's hard. But when you get one to hit and you have a, an effect that is so far beyond some bullshit TikTok clip that does whatever views it does, and it actually goes right to the point where it catalyzes not only a whole community uh, around the country in a way because he was a West Pointer and knew so many people, but also directly impacted the family to where I never expected that, but they happen to be having a really in particularly tough day and week. And it just came at the right time. When we talk about the universe wants things to happen, like I always point, you ever hear that Rick Rubin quote, the great producer? No. Oh, it's phenomenal. Rick Rubin's like the best producer of all time. Mm -hmm. He's worked with every type of musician. Mm -hmm. And like a, he's got, he, he looks like, um, who was that old writer who used to write the books, like The Tree, The Crew, or S Silverstein? Yeah, yeah, Shel yeah. Silver. yeah he's yeah. got like the yes. beard and yes. all that shit. He has a quote, he's got a lot of great quotes, but he had one where he said, sometimes the pieces fall into place where it's almost like the universe wants it to happen. <laughs> and when I hear shit like that, because when I see these clips come together and I kind of know when it's a special one and I see that piano drop on that first bar, it's like a bar when you're talking mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. you're like, he lost his son and the piano comes on the he. Bum, bum, dun, dun. Mm -hmm. And it's like, then it falls in after hours of looking for a song and not having anything work running mm -hmm. through Adele all these different people and then I get this one and it's like oh and then you see it there it's like something special about that then you put it out and all this other butterfly effect shit happens and you have something like that happen I, it's a humbling thing but it is that's the kind of you want to talk about like picking me up on the other side too holy shit man I mean and then I was texting with the coach great guy great it's guy. like to hear that 
uh, there's nothing to say other than thank you for the compliment, but also, you know, I'm glad we could do that. I, Wonderful. I, I just don't, I, I can tell you that, um, you know, I've had a lot of what I thought were special moments in my life, but that phone call based on what we did in here will be something that I think about for a long time. And it, um, and it drives, it drives me to do more, you know, to mm -hmm. do more for more people. And that's your impact, bro. Like you are a smart dude. This is wonderfully done. It's going to be highly successful. And at the end of the day, this will be an impact piece that you will, you will talk about in your thirties, forties, and fifties. That is a story I will tell. You 100%. know, and it's, yeah. it's kind of like we, we brought that together just by having a conversation because of the kind of people that we like to, to talk and, and praise, you know, it's a family that's an inspirational family. And in this year, you know, the 20th anniversary of 9-11, which I can't believe, but you think about, and Sheila says it herself, my wife says it herself, like we get to talk about all those people at least once a year, their names are, and, and rightfully More than so, that. Yeah. More, right? Yes. At least once a year, right? Yeah. So, but guys like Chris Morgan, see, that doesn't happen right. as much. And it's not because people don't want it to happen. It just doesn't. And that's what, what April was worried about, right? Like, I got I got to just tell one other story and uh, it's Jim, another Jim, you can tell piece. whatever stories you want to tell because you're one of the best storytellers I've ever heard. The other thing, and I want to say this early on here. Yeah. You got a hotel for the night. Yeah. So we're not going anywhere. Exactly. Yeah. This is going very well so far. I just want to put it out there if this ends up happening. We might do two podcasts here. We <laughs> might. No, seriously. Like I might break this up into like two, two and a half hour podcasts if mm -hmm. we keep going like this. But so, whatever stories you got, bring them. So, go. so here's here's one you like. So I'm invited or, or I'm actually playing in a in a, uh, a member guest golf tournament um, that my – beautiful wife was kind enough in my retirement to to buy me a membership at a, at a really nice golf club in the jersey shore and chris spar international uh, there we go spar <laughs> the spar boys and that's where this is going right so um anyway i play every year with a guy by the name of jim McHugh, who's the older brother of my best friend who i lost in afghanistan uh John McHugh, Colonel John McHugh, killed mm. uh, May 18th, 2010. Uh, my dearest friend in the world. What's that uh, foundation? So, so, the Johnny Mac Soldiers Fund. And it's uh, and it's cranking. on the board of that. On the board on that, we, that. All my West Point classmates are on the board. We uh, we do some good things. We have a lot of good disagreements. It's it's good. It's it's going great. So what, what it, Just very quickly, I want to give a plug yeah, for that. Yeah. I, I, I like so, that. Can you just tell people what exactly you guys are funding there? Yeah, I think it's absolutely. Awesome. So it's... There is a need of about $55 million to send to college or trade school or any type of educational institution for all of those surviving children on the war on terror. So um, the need is significant. It's still there. And obviously, we just kind of end it uh, with some awful, um, you know, uh, sacrifices in Afghanistan on We'll get the last to few days, and and some of those people had kids, so we got a mission for at least another seventeen or eighteen years, which is great. And hopefully, we're we're spry enough to be able to do that. So, so you guys keep a running list of all of them, all of them, all of them. Wow! And um, you know, we've raised almost thirty million dollars since two thousand fifteen, and so we're we're more than halfway there. And uh, so ultimately, um, I'm playing with Jimmy McHugh, and uh, again, a dear one of my dearest friends. We're we're brothers, really, and. His youngest brother, my best friend in the world growing up, you know, went to West Point together, deployed together. Um, you know, we, we just were around for each other. He left five kids. We paid, started out paying for those five kids, and, and it's developed into this. But the reason I talk about Jimmy McHugh is that day we're paired up in our flight with a, a, a guy who you know, Chris Spar, but his brother Mike Spar um, is – is it be, has become a dear friend and just just a genuinely incredible family and mike brings along his guest and um he's introduced as chris you know and shake chris's hand chris is a, a young guy and what i noticed most about him is he's an incredible golfer even though we beat them you know we, we knocked him off and um but as we're kind of playing um you know i said different to chris, chris right different chris not chris yeah, Barr. Okay. so i said to chris Hey man, what uh, what do you do for a living? So he says, uh, "Well, I'm a fireman, New York fireman." So I said, mm -hmm. "Wow, that's really cool." 
And I said, how long have you been on the job? He said, well, you know, uh, about 10 or so years. I said, the house that you're in, was it hit pretty hard during 9-11? And so he says, no, nah, my house was okay. So my dad's house was hit pretty hard. As soon as he said it, you know, I knew. And he said, uh, I said, really? And he said, yeah, my dad passed, you know, in 9-11. And uh, he says, I was 18 years old. And I was a, um, I was a student at Quinnipiac uh, University with, and that's where I was roommates with Mike Spar. Dennis and, McHugh? Uh, actually, no, the, uh, Jimmy McHugh, it, his last name is Mascali, M-A-S-C-A-L-I. Uh, oh, right, different guy. So Chris says, um, I was a freshman at Quinnipiac. Uh, Mike Spar was my roommate and we've been inseparable friends. And um, I said, really? And later I found out that Chris Mascali was a pretty successful trader on Wall Street, you know, who sometime in his mid-20s or late 20s, the fire department offered a legacy program. So they basically said, look, there's a list um, for New York firemen, and uh, it's pretty pretty long, right? And it's hard to get on. And But if you're a legacy and, and dad or mom passed in the towers, we'll take you on. Chris leaves his oh, he highly it. successful Wall Street job, and he is now one of the most respected New York firemen out there. And there was an article on 9-11 about the 80 or so you know, offspring of 9-11 victim firefighters who have become – it's a great article. It's in the New York Times. And anyway, we start, we start talking, and the connection was immediate. Um. I said, Jesus, how did we, we're, you know, out of a couple hundred people, we're in the same flight and we're playing on the first day in this first match. And this, this young man has become an inspiration for me, not only in the fact of his sacrifice and his something bigger than yourself, but I envision him as a role model for my stepkids, you know, my stepsons who, you know, have been looking for someone of their age to kind right. of talk to them about they were five and seven. He was 18. Right? right. So no easy time to lose dad, but 18 in my opinion is a hell of a lot, you know, more timely than it's harder. I think because you're, you're just, you're like, Holy shit. You know, I need, I finally, I finally think this guy had some good ideas and he's gone, you know? And so, but you had him, but you had him. Right. Yeah. So, I envision this being a godsend for my family and that when it does take shape, because it will, because Chris has agreed to take these boys to dinner and, and just be around them, which I think is important. But we talked a little bit about the universe kind of setting mm. things, right? And here's my best buddy's brother who is playing golf with me that day, and here's Chris Mascali. And I looked and I said to myself – holy cow, like this is amazing, you know? And so we continue, you know, we continue to find these things in our life. And, and I think it goes on to talking like we talked about, helping, you know, being around, being present for others, even though we may think we're in the worst situation that's ever happened to, you know, we're the only one, man. Everybody's looking out at us. Everybody's, no, you know, it's out there. It's still out there, you know? And so you have, you have like, I think you've enlightened, or I hate to use, I'm not using, a, you know, woken. Um, no. um, <laughs> That's but, not a woke word. Go um, on now. So, Don't but, give them all of them. But, but you, have, you have allowed me to see and be present in things that do happen. You know, through this, which I fought tooth and nail, not wanting to come on here because I was like, ah, you know what, I wanted to being stupid and saying stuff that I shouldn't be saying, you know. Do you remember? Ever, do you remember? If I ever become the FBI director, this is going to be a congressional yeah, tape. But that's yeah. all right. I'll just take the second. Uh, Mike Pompeo, I, I Jim Yacone should be the FBI director. I will take the IG spot right under him. Mm. I'll do all the damage. Oh, you'll do the IG. Oh, yeah. You little snitch, you. I can't wait. You little fucking snitch. No, not snitchy. Just, no, I'm just kidding. Systems. I'm kidding. Systems. But systems. still, you know what else is funny? I remember like when you were first going to come in here. Yeah. Part of the reason you didn't, and this is such a weird thing in the universe now, all things considered, was because that golf tournament the year before got rained out. 
yeah cj morgan's golf tournament yes and then it got moved and then we never did it yep and it's like and then you talked about it yep fucking six months later seven yep. months later yep. and then you come on here and now that's right there's a second part to it because that content lives isn't you know that what crazy I mean? it's, yeah it's, it's the so, way it sets up you know and it's you know we um we argued back and forth about why the merits of not for me of not coming on and again it goes to intent what the fuck was i you know at the time i was thinking about myself well you know what i got to think about maybe fuck that you know there's a lot to be there's a lot to be garnered for me this is powerful this is impactful for me and i can be selfish about that point because sometimes you just got to be a taker in your life you can't always be a giver but i my hope is that at some point i will I will inspire through our discussions someone to do some more for themselves, for themselves, because it will it will make a difference. It will make a difference. This has made a huge difference for me. Huge. Jim, you have no idea how glad I am to hear you say that. And there, there's two things here. The first thing you don't have to respond to. The second thing I actually want you to respond to, though. The first thing is you – are f so fucking bad at taking things for yourself. You're very bad, and that's kind of a compliment, right? You are, when you got into the private sector, you were used to your career where you set an objective and you accomplished it, and it didn't require you to have to sell yourself or anything. It was like, get the job done. This guy did a bad thing. Let's figure it out. Let's get it done, right? And even in your military career in a different format, I mean, that's, that's what you were doing. Objective, let's go. Then you come into the private sector, and you got a lot of friends and you're the kind of guy you're like, all right, I'll do this for 20 K instead of 80. And it's like, well, no, Jim, that, that job costs 80. That's what you should do. And I know like you and I talked about that a lot and I relate because I'm bad at that too. I think I can see that like when that happens. And like, I think a lot of people more than you realize that doesn't go unnoticed because people are like, damn, he really took it. That man just took care of that for us. Holy shit. What a guy, you know? So it does come back to you. And to see you at least grabbing a bull by the horns and also not for nothing. I mean, this is a very transparent platform. We know that. You knew that coming in. I mean, if ever you were going to tell the truth and put it out there and leave yourself open to whatever scrutiny there is, this is the place you're doing it. You know, and, and I, the first episode was like a wow factor in that facet for me. I was stunned at some of the things you were even willing to say on there and people noticed we now have that as like an understanding. There's been, it's been viewed tens of thousands, I think hundreds of thousands of times, not on YouTube. It's at like 30 grand, but it's got a lot of downloads. I got to check it. It's, it's a lot, whatever it is. And people, that leads in the second point, which is that people reached out to me. They actually did it in the public comments a little bit too. But like personally, I had people reaching out to me saying, I want this guy to come and teach me how to do life. You have to bring him in again because, like, I don't know how it would be possible, but sometime I want to talk with him and have him tell me how to be a man. I have people say this to me, and I know there's a – people can go check the YouTube from episode 48. I know there's at least one or two public comments where people said this, and they're not kidding because for whatever reason now, I, I think Gen Z especially, which is where these comments were coming from, you know, whether or not they have a father in the house or anything, there is, they're growing up in a weird time. There's a lot of weird. shit out there. And you're an, you are a perfect blend of an old school guy who is very open minded. Like you're this, you're this lifelong military guy, FBI guy, conservative kind of politics guy, but you, you call it like you see it. You, and you, you put out your, you're willing to stand by your opinions. You're willing to listen to all sides. You're willing to be friends with Post Malone. You know, you're that guy. Well, that like guy. that's a beautiful thing. And so I think that shined through so openly in the last episode that there was a human aspect outside of what you do and where you've been and the crazy shit you've seen. There's, there was a human aspect where people were like, this guy gets it. This guy is a blend of strength and understanding. That's what I want. That's the man figure that I've been looking for. Mm. And so when I see people watch or listen to a podcast and – take that away from just listening to a guy for three hours to me as the guy who hosts it it doesn't get any better than that wow that's humbling i mean i can't tell you because you know you i've learned from the best my dad in some you know family 
family friends and you know it's just it, it's humbling i i can't say really i'm kind of at a loss for words on that you know and um it, it kind of i tell you like the one thing that when you're saying this the one thing that came to mind right away and and i i'm not sure if we talked about it the last time but there was a an old school organized crime mafia source of mine that we became friends and and the funniest part about this is that we never met face to face you did not tell this no, you, you never told met the story face to face. you told the story about the square hip yeah, squatter yeah, no yeah. no so we never met face to face but we talked daily and, Wait, and how did that work? It's it's a dynamic that can only be in the intel community. You know, it just can. And uh, and this guy was he stretched beyond just your organized crime mafia, you know, kind of thing. He he had some additional information. But wait, question. I just have to ask. Yeah. Like, how does this work? So, because this isn't like 2021 in the pandemic where you're just talking on Zoom and no. maybe that's a thing. But like, someone else got him as a source, and then you were. I was with him? I had an issue that I needed help on. Okay. And um, this guy was pointed in my direction by by a um, a long time associate of mine, um, and we just you know we 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 did a three way uh, satellite call, and I never really knew where he was or he was a mobster. He was a mobster, and he had a lot of overseas connections. And um, he said to me the most powerful thing he ever said to me was. You know, he got to know my family. Like, you get to know, and you're not supposed to do this, but, you know, I really felt like I could trust the guy, and and I'm pretty mm. good at that. And he shared his open, you know, um, struggles, and I shared mine. And, and one of the things that I said to him is, hey, you know, Sammy, you know, he, he went by Sammy. I don't know what the hell his name was, but hey, Sammy. Not, not Sammy the Bull. No, no, okay. definitely not, even though we know that I've <laughs> So he said, Sammy, I said, Sammy, um, I'm struggling with one thing. He said, what's that? And I told him about being a stepdad, you know, and I, I just said, like, it's hard, man. You know, it's, you know, one dad is, the two older boys' dad passed, and the other the other boy's dad is a difficult guy, you know, and, uh, and he said to me, Jimmy, have you ever backed away from anything? <laughs> and I said, no, not really, probably to a fault, you know, and he said, well, God placed you in the path of this kid. So, and he he basically leaned in closer to the phone, and I could just see him doing it, although it wasn't with him. And he said, "So don't fuck it up." <laughs> and you know, kind of changed my life, man. So when you say, you know, when you talk about people who are, you know, hoping for advice or or just want to be, want to hear uplifting things about life and how they they can live that life, you know, whatever that life is that brings it, like. That brings it home for me, like the impact. So as powerful as that was, you know, as powerful as it was to have, you know, a talk from somebody you'd least expect it from to say, hey, you're placed in the path of this kid and I can make a difference and I hope that I have. And I've said to Sheila a bunch of times, I just hope someday when he's 30 or 40 and I'm still around and he just says, see that guy over there? It's not my dad, but damn, he made a difference, mm. you know? And I think that's what you just said to me now. So, yeah. the, so the power of that is, you know, it's humbling. You know, it's humbling to have the ability, and we're 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 fortunate. You know, it's a blessing and a curse, technology and the ability to do this. But at the same time, man, it is it is powerful stuff, and it's and I don't take it lightly. Like I don't take it lightly, and I think the biggest thing when you and I went back and forth about be coming on here there was there was a lot of things that passed through my mind but they were fleeting about it what do you the, mean like you know like shit well i what if i'm ever you know what if i ever get a chance to do this or be this or maybe i shouldn't tell that or what if i they were fleeting thoughts they didn't stay but the one thing that stayed and it's my and we talked about it it's my core negative belief is i'm not i'm not worthy i'm not good enough to have people listen to advice from me like who the fuck am i <laughs> That you know, the the son of a of a you know World War II fireman who just worked his ass off two jobs, you know, and I just tried to do them, you know, failed marriage, and you know, and um, you know, certainly 
made a lot of mistakes along the way, but then you start, you know, you start believing that that's okay. You know, as long as you heal from those things that make you feel as if you're not good enough. And we've talked about this last time, West Pointers as a group, my opinion, we don't think we're good enough. And blows that's what mind. drives us. Blows my mind. Yeah. And it does me too. And and there's there's classmates of mine that'll say, Oh, you know, I'll say it at the reunion next week and, and I'll have half the group. And we got three hundred and thirty classmates coming. That's amazing. Nobody ever gets that. And uh, you know, I'll have half of them say, Well, you're fucking crazy, you know? We were but then I guarantee you those guys one by one will call me back over the next year and say, Shit, you're right. And I use it as a good thing. Like it, it's okay. You know, yeah. it's okay because it drives us to do more, you know? And so I think that's kind of the most humbling part about it is that I actually have the ability to, through my transparency, and I appreciate you saying that too, because I, I really am open about everything. I, I want to hear it for what it is, and I want to try to make the best decisions. And, and I, I'm not – I am – I guess unwavering about one thing and that's my love of this country, you know, mm. and, and I will fight that. I just said to somebody and, and don't take this wrong family. Cause I love you so much, but I said to somebody who insulted West point recently in the last six months, they How did. So? And they said something, just, just something that was uncalled for. And I said, you're better off talking shit about my family than you are talking about West Point. Mm. And it's just been different with the person and, and I'll get it together and it'll come back, but it'll never come all the way back, you know? So, and I think what I mean, what I mean by that is like, be loyal, be loyal to something that's bigger than yourself. And it's okay to make mistakes. Oh, they the were a West day, Pointer. No, they weren't. Oh. Just talk shit about stuff, you know? And Got it. You don't Got fucking it. know. You have no idea. You know? So I'd rather you just don't say anything, you mm -hmm. know, than, like, talk bad about my kids. Talk bad about, like, I can I can deal with that because I can go one for one and I can talk to you about why that's not true or why it is true. And, we, and we're working on it. But when you talk about something that you have no understanding of what people have gone through in order to get to the spot that they're at and everybody's suffering you know and 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 it's the 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 pts and the and the things that happen to people like don't don't overlook that don't make believe like it's and I, and i have a chip on my shoulder about that because i'm like you don't know so hey rumson guy you don't fucking know so shut the fuck up you know like honestly but then my wife has taught me to look at it and say well wait a minute you know they don't understand that's that's why they educate them Tell them why it's important. Don't just don't just write them off. And I think we do that so much. And so if you know, if I have people that I'm helping through just being honest about things and, and they say, shit, that's me. Like I have a chip. It's okay to have a big time chip on your shoulder because sometimes it makes you work hard, but don't carry it with you because it is devastating. It, it will be devastating to you and to your family and to everything around you. You know, just walk around like, oh, that guy, who you think? You know, don't rip up everybody else's life, I guess is what it's saying. And that's coming from a guy who I'm sure wrecked a lot of family Thanksgivings, you know, along the way. And But no intent, just doing my job, right? And so when you hear a mobster say, going to be a bear, be a grizzly, I get it. Like, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to go all out. Otherwise, I'll just go work an insurance job, you know, and and – Doing, I had a great job with Progressive Insurance. You know, a great back in, a, the day. back in the day. I had a great job. Now, did that develop into something more for the bureau? Yeah, but I loved the job. I loved the training. Maybe it wasn't who I said I was when I was working at Progressive, but I learned everything. I know how to write a unibody, man. I can tell you how many hours you need to pull on the machine, and <laughs> you know that's that's a skin. That's not a, that's a shell. You got to put the whole door on there, door frame. You can't just put the skin on there. I'm pretty good at that. <laughs> But it also, you know, you know, all the tricks. Yeah, it was also avoiding other adjusters from getting thrown in the trunks of cars. In <laughs> Rhode Island, so um, not up in Providence. They wouldn't. Providence. Do that. They wouldn't do that. Up nah, there. nah. The Boy. boys, Johnny or whatever the guy's name was at Providence Auto Body. If you're still out there, bro, you were funny as shit. I can't tell that story, so we'll leave that there. <laughs> I know that's one of the off limits ones, but that it is. You you talk about this whole concept of like 
and I don't think you used this word, but you were hitting on it. You were talking about like imperfection in yourself, like what you were saying. Why would people take advice from me? And there was yeah. there was a ton you just said in there, but I want to focus on this one thing. Have you ever heard of the IMU theory? No. Okay. A couple of the OGs listening to this podcast will remember this from the earliest days because I did cover it, and I think it only ever came up once after that. But the IMU theory was this thing created by this guy, Charlie Jabali. And Charlie is – his claim to fame was that he was the manager for 2 Chains, and I forget the other guys. There was, there was another duo he had, big rap duo in Atlanta. But he was a manager of rappers, and essentially – he had been a fat kid in his mom's basement who loved hip hop. And so he built a studio down there, like literally, like this 300 pound kid living in his mom's basement, builds a studio, gets talent to roll through, <laughs> ends up finding Two Chains, becomes his manager. Two Chains becomes Two Chains. And then everything's like he's big. And so he had been out of shape his whole life, gets a brain tumor. And so he leaves it all behind. He loses all this weight and he has this whole thing where he's like, and he's such an interesting guy. He's very, very eccentric, but he helps a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Helps a fuck ton. Of, that's his whole brand, quote unquote. But he's like, all right, I always wanted to be an athlete despite how I was not in shape. So I'm going to become a Nike athlete. And he does like a triathlon and then gets in the commercial like with Kaepernick and shit. Like literally like the whole full-blown Nike thing and leaves behind the music career. And mm. then starts this whole thing. And he came out with this theory. It was on the Ed Milet podcast a couple years ago. And I remember watching it for the first time. It was on Instagram. And the clip, it had the nice music behind it and everything. It only had maybe like 1,700 views when I looked at it. To this day, I haven't looked back, but I, I guarantee it doesn't have that many. And I think it might be the most overlooked thing that is a life changer that's ever come out. And essentially mm. what it was, I told you it was called the IMU theory, but yeah. his question one day was, who's the highest grossing superhero of all time? And so he went to Google to look it up and it includes comics, movies, everything. And he's thinking it's going to be Superman, Batman. And he finds out it's, it's Spider-Man. Mm. He's like, that's interesting. Spider-Man's face was completely covered. Yep. There was no chiseled chin. No. He was an average looking dude who was from, you know, a lower class household. His parents were dead. He was raised by his aunt and uncle. Yep. Didn't have much. Had a weird talent. He wasn't he wasn't flying through the air like Superman. No. He wasn't he was he was normal in a lot of ways, minus his superhero power. He's yeah. like, oh, okay, that's Just interesting. The radioactive spider. So then he started, you know, that's a superhero. So he's like, All right, let's think about other things that have attention and culture. He goes, All right, what about organized religion? And so he Googles the most popular organized religion in the world by following, and it's Christianity. Mm. And I forget what the number was, but it was the most popular. And he goes, okay, who's the face of Christianity? He's like, Jesus Christ. All right, let's, let's think about Jesus here. Dressed very humbly. I don't think that's a word, but he dressed in a humble way. Yeah. He was a carpenter, worked yeah. with his hands. He hung out with poor people. He only had 12 disciples. He didn't ride around on this beautiful shining horse. Like in that time, if you had ridden around with shining armor on a, on the, on a white right. horse that was almost like a unicorn yep. with a shield and a sword, you had power. You were, you, were the, you were the important big deal, all yeah. this shit. Yeah. And he's like, he was just a normal guy. He just happened to be able to turn water into wine and yeah. all this other shit. Yep. Huh. What about with sports heroes? And he goes... Who's the most popular athlete ever in America, at least, but, you know, to an extent around the world? I guess Michael Jordan. Exactly. He yeah. goes Michael Jordan. Yeah. Now, we know a lot about Michael Jordan now. We do, but the beginnings were a cut, right? Not just the beginnings, but during his career, a lot of shit that maybe isn't so great we didn't yeah. see. Because it yeah. wasn't, for, to his credit, he was not a major attention guy in that way. Yeah. Wasn't the social media era. So you didn't, you didn't know what you couldn't see. Yep. And we saw yep. all the great things. Yep. And so he thought about Michael Jordan and he's like, okay. He was cut from his high school basketball yep. team. Yep. He had to hit a growth spurt. Yep. He was from, what's the word? He, he, he was from normal means. Normal means, Southern, Southern family, a lot of kids. Right. Dad was, you know, dad wasn't, was around, but not really. Right. 
And yeah. then he That's true. makes a career after he gets cut from the high school basketball team where he constantly has to prove something, including when he finally goes to the NBA. He's coming from UNC, which he got himself into, playing for Dean Smith, and he's still not the number one pick. He, he's number three. He's drafted behind Sam Bowie. And so he had, right. to, he had to prove, yeah. and he went to Chicago, which had no history no, as a franchise. No, they weren't supposed to be anything. Yeah. And then he wins everything. And he's like, it's, it's not Kobe's fault. It's not LeBron's fault. They're, they're from different eras, different yep. situations. But like Kobe, Kobe was the Mamba. He wasn't, he made it like that. And, I, and obviously Kobe's a legend. I love Kobe. And everyone should admire how he worked and, and what he did. Absolutely. For, it's incredible what yep. he did. But he was the Mamba. He was the black mamba. He was his show was called after his career was called Spotlight. He was different than you. Yep. And in a way, that was a great thing. That was who he was and it's what made him great. Michael Jordan probably would have been that way. We just didn't see it because of the era. Yep. And so we saw the story and it was like, fuck, I'm just like him. Then his dad dies and he leaves everything behind because he goes into a righteously so a, a a mental state where he's like holy shit what the fuck what's it all yep. for my father was just killed in that yep. i mean his dad was yep. also murdered yep so it's like people saw in him and he's like wow what about corporations if it could be true for a corporation then this might be something that i'm on to here yeah and he goes who's the most popular corporation of all time mcdonald's no most popular, biggest, important corporation of all time to this point in world history. It's going to start getting arguable soon, but it's inarguable right now. IBM? Apple. Apple. And he yeah. said, who was the founder of Apple? That yep. guy. Yep. Steve Jobs. Yep. Steve Jobs, who was the first CEO to lose the suit. He wore the beard, scraggly hair. Walked around like your dad was also highly imperfect. Yep. Highly imperfect. Yep. He was, and even like, he didn't follow the regular formative path. The guy was tripping acid in the, in the desert to come up with the ideas that would become Apple when he was like 23. He was, he was like the normal kid trying to find his way. True. So even for all his imperfections, yeah. the things that he left us were far outweighed any imperfections. And yet- that imp that imperfect nature of who he was and then what he was able to accomplish and the way he looked and the way he made people feel doing it. Holy shit. Steve Powerful. Jobs was just like us. So Powerful. he's like Spider-Man, highest grossing superhero of all time. Jesus Christ, most important religious figure of all time. Michael Jordan, most followed athlete of all time. Steve Jobs made people love a corporation. People were crying at his funeral yep. or yep. memorial service. Yep. Yep. It's like all these people... In this world where everyone wants to say, I'm famous, I'm not like you, I'm not like you, I'm on this stage, I have this spotlight on me, I'm important, I wear all these important clothes, I have these expensive watches, I, 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 got, all, I, I got all the women around me, I, or if, if you're a female, I got whatever man I want, whatever. All the people who have meant the most important, they've made the most important impact in culture over time. Been like you and me. They're just like you. Yeah. And they're just like you for all the reasons that they're People great. see it. And all the reasons why they're not and where they get things wrong. People can relate. Yes. And so in a world that seems to constantly churn out perfection to us, the people who overall their resume is they do great things far more than they do things that maybe they regret. The people who do that and are open about it and are willing to share those stories and are willing to put themselves out there and, and give you a light that can guide you. Oh, society loves that. Love it. I think that's, that's great. You. I never thought about it. Makes sense. God, it makes sense. Yeah. And it's nice to just be, and they were comfortable with themselves. Yes. Comfortable in what they what they knew and comfortable in telling you what they didn't. You know? And uh, you can't say that about a lot of people. No. You know, you can't say it about a lot of people. And they had, they were, they were vulnerable and they allowed the world to see that i.e. Jordan's father passing and him trying to play baseball. He looked terrible, you know. I mean, was, Space Jam was great, but um, but yeah, I mean, th that is that is some great. I mean, that's that's a great way to think about things, you know. And there's so much out there that like that you can relate to. I, I just saw, I just saw probably, and I was just telling one of my buddies last night about it. Um, he's the guy. He's a great dude. He he runs a horse business, West Point Thoroughbreds. Oh, yeah, he won the Kentucky Derby yep. and. Oh, he won it? Yeah, he won it a few years ago with Always Dreaming. Uh, I was going to so, say, because this year that was the whole like... Yeah, no, he won it a few yeah. years ago. And we were talking last night, and we always kind of trade off um, 
you know, things that happen in our lives. And, and, and the, the topic here was a, a really dear friend who was the chaplain at West Point when we were cadets was recently accused of, you know, Catholic priest and, mm -hmm. and molestation. And um, it was devastating for us because, you know, I don't want to get too much into the church or how they handle things, but everything's just just negotiate everything is it's not is settled yeah. you know and uh and what's left behind is terrible on both sides right because you know i don't want to believe it but it i have to believe it right it so happens. but we as we were talking about that we were looking for inspiration within the church and i had just one of my one of our dear friends and classmates a guy by the name of matt polakowski who was cruising in his military career and uh he gets a calling and he he goes to seminar uh, seminary. I'm sorry. He winds up going to seminary and becoming a Catholic priest, and he's he's been around for funerals of ours, and you know always been around for us. But he just had the honor of reading, and and there's a um, a military chaplain whose remains were just discovered in the Republic of Korea, and from the Korean War. From the Korean War, and the guy's name is Father Emil Kapan, like it's K A P A U M, and there's one surviving. Um, witness to his deeds while and, he, and he's he's put forward for canonization and uh, there's one surviving witness to his deeds who wrote this letter but couldn't couldn't get up just not physically capable of getting up and reading it at his memorial or his, i think it was his canonization ceremony and his memorial returning his remains his body's intact completely right so my buddy our classmate gets up and reads it and in it, he, you could tell Matt rehearsed it, you know, and read it over hundreds of times and so much so that he, it was like, it was coming from him. It was that amazing, but many times throughout it, he gets emotional. But the one part that stuck out to me is two things. And, um, and you talk about just a normal, just a normal person who's now, you know, in the Catholic church's eyes, you know, qualified, certified as a saint, but, and there's a couple things that are in there. First one is a miracle. Um, that someone has to witness. And the second one is just his um, constant, unwavering, unconditional giving, mm -hmm. being available and sacrificing everything. And there's some pictures of him saying mass, you know, in different spots with, with a war zone going on and soldiers are kneeling. But one of the, one of the two things that struck me, one was his, his ability to relate and to make humor in a situation, you know, it was during the Bataan death march. It was during the time when there was uh, no hope, you know, it's a forgotten you, war too. forgotten war. If you fell behind on a, on a march, they just shot you. Right. It was like, like a Stephen King, like a Stephen King novel gone bad. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and all those heroes that, that passed, but Capon, willed himself to stay alive in spite of sacrificing meals and any little bit they had for others. And uh, during the freezing cold, not wearing the clothing that he should have been, giving it to other injured and wounded and dying, and and basically ministering to all these people, all these soldiers that had given up hope in bringing light mm -hmm. to their time. So they talk about one instance where a man recognizes him and he says, Father Capon, like... um you know, how did you, how did you get here? Like, what are you doing here? He says, and he looked around and he said, Hey, my Bishop doesn't know, don't tell him. <laughs> and that there, like his ability to bring people forward, that was one thing. And then he gets to the end of the letter and Matt's reading it and he does an amazing job. And he says, you know, there's, there's the, the miracle piece. And, um, his body was the only one that wasn't thrown in these mass graves over a hill where they discovered hundreds of, upon hundreds of dead GIs that had just died in the death houses and where they would put them. And anyway, Capone every night would go out and minister. He would sneak out. He would bring whatever food he could steal and from, you know, the, the guards. And he would go out and he would minister and say prayers and whatever. And one night he leaves and one of the guys who was dying says, where is father? And he said, well, father's out ministering. He said, well, I need last rites and I'm not going to make it. And the guy, the guy passes. And, an hour goes by, Capon comes back and he prays and he takes the guy's head in his hands and the guy comes back to life. No, yeah. come on. And and then gives him the last rites and he passes. 
And anyway, so now this is, you know, this is Matt Polakowski. He's one of my dearest friends who's, who's interviewing, who, who took this letter from this guy who's a West Point class of, you know, I think he was a West Point class of 39 or 40 guys in a hundred years old. And the guy is sitting in the first, and they film it. They had it filmed. The guy's sitting in the first row, just tears rolling down his eyes, you know, and there's no incentive, but I think my point in thinking back of like who we are and how we have an effect that story. And, and I'm, I've given up some hope on the, on the Catholic Church. You know, I, I've I've seen too much. I've Me done, too. you know, I've done independent investigations. You know, uh, in my business um, for the Diocese of Albany, and 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 really, the Church doesn't want to. They don't want to really go out and interview victims. They don't want to do, and I think that's an important piece because Wait, I think work for them or yeah, I've, I was contracted for like the better part of a year when I first started. Ugh. So during that time, I, I had a hard time dealing with the church because I was like, well, you, you really should talk to the victims because you shouldn't just write a check. We need to find out why this is happening. What's going on? Like, what are the don't? No, nope. we'd rather not know. We have a budget. And I think, I'll tell you, I think in my time, and I covered about a five-year period, I want to, I, it was maybe 13 to 18 in one diocese, the Diocese of Albany, which is huge. It's got a lot of churches. The settlements in those five years, $100 million, one diocese, five years for just that. So, you know... I think in saying this, I, I was like just distraught. And when I saw this Father Capon piece that my classmate brought to the table, you know, it just was enough. I was like, because if Matt Polakowski, who beat the dickens of, out of me in plea boxing and freshman boxing at West Point, if it's good enough for him, who the fuck am I, you know, to say anything more than let's support it, you know, let's be what we can for Matt. And so, I think that goes to the same piece we were talking about. Like it's, I can relate to that guy, you know, because he was somebody who I was at a time, you know, and now he is guiding me through, even though he doesn't know it, but he'll know it next week when I see him, guiding me through difficult times, a continuous difficult times in our lives. You know, it's the same thing that we all face and it's nice to feel, um, First off, it's nice to, to no longer have to attach myself to an outcome. I could just kind of see it, you know, and kind of just take it for what it is and be that taker that we talked about. I don't have to give. And it, I felt like I was taking from off of Matt's back mm. by this story. And I felt it it helped me. It, it truly helped me to for the first time in my life not to attach to an outcome. I always was attached to an outcome. So um, when you're saying, I want to make sure I understand that. Though, yeah. Because I'm a little confused. Yeah. By the way, I, my, my mug just. Uh, it's okay. You were, that was damaged like five minutes in. Happens all the time. <laughs> but you're, you were telling the story, which has its own significance as like mm -hmm. it puts things in perspective and it shows that there's good in things. I got that. Then you're putting it up against also some of the reality, which is not pretty. Nope. And I agree with you. Like, you know, I have my own relationship with a higher power, so yep. to speak. I'm, I grew up Catholic. I don't identify that way. I, I'm mm -hmm. just, you know, but for people who are into organized religion, it's an important thing in their life. I fully support that. Yep. As long as it doesn't come into my politics. Totally I, agree. I fully totally support agree. that. I but think it's wonderful. I understand where you're coming from, where you, and you see it, unfortunately, up close. And I don't know how you even sleep at night thinking about that. But was the point that you would be predisposed to just kind of roll in your eyes at this kind of situation because it's like, oh, this is just another Catholic priest, Jesus Christ, I already know what happens with all those guys, and which is unfair to say, but you know what I mean, versus like, all right, you know, this is my buddy reading it, who also happens to be a Catholic priest, mm -hmm. and this is an interesting story from somebody who was in a combat zone as well, which I know all too well, unfortunately, mm -hmm. and who died in a way serving his country let's call it what it is yep. you know so yep. is that the point yeah i mean i think it's and it's also kind of whatever you need in your life to help you to relate to difficult you know kind of times mm. um i don't ever think before this particular story short of the fact that my parents were both um 
you know, probably the most faithful people religiously that I knew, short than McHugh, you know, the McHugh parents, John McHugh's parents. But I needed something more to kind of get me back into an open mind about the Catholic mm. Church after what I had I had seen. And I, I think what, what kind of struck with me, what you were talking about is, I think that's what we don't do enough. I mean, I'm sitting here guessing McDonald's and I'm guessing IBM. In the meantime, you know, why didn't I guess, you know, Apple? And I think the reason is because I don't view them as being something, sometimes I don't view them as being something that has helped along the way, right? Because of my law enforcement background, right? So they blocked our ability for the San Bernardino, right? Fucking Okay, boom, let, let's right? okay, hold on a minute. Hold, so, hold on so, a minute. Hold on. Yeah, hold on. Yeah. Back off. We we gotta we gotta get the dogs down on this one and actually yeah. address that. Mm-hmm. So you didn't like that. I, I just thought it's strange like why I, I guessed the other two right away. Other three right away. As soon as you said superhero, I was like Spider Man, like in my mind. Yeah, but the San Bernardino thing. We'll yeah. bring that up. Well, that's just you know, that was fucking obstruction. So Okay. Good. It's obstruction. I, I, I like this. I like this. I disagree. I think I can understand where you're coming from because what we can all agree on is that guy was a scumbag. He did a horrible thing. He was a thing. fucking terrorist. Yeah, he was a terrorist. He did a horrible thing. And what happens when a horrible thing happens? You want to get answers. You want accountability. You want to make sure you do your best to be able to disincentivize anything like that happening again. Somehow some shit always does, but you want to minimize those situations moving forward. That's the idea of law enforcement no yeah i mean uh, agreed agreed with some caveat okay but agreed for the yeah on the address that theoretically i agree okay when when you address what i'm gonna say feel free to go into that caveat Yeah, yeah while apple has done other quote unquote hypocritical things in the eyes of privacy and individual rights since then and probably before I can also say at the same time that if there has been any company among big tech that has been more about individual rights and and some sense of privacy in this world of no privacy, it is them. It's basically like saying they're a dwarf among midgets. No offense intended, obviously, there. But you know what I mean. With this situation, it was another slippery slope example where Tim Cook is saying to himself, and I agreed with what he did, he's saying... The federal government, the FBI in this case, is publicly pressuring me, the CEO of a company who handles people's data, to hand over a phone of a guy who we know was evil. We know he was bad. But if I hand this over, who the fuck else am I going to hand it over for? And where is the public trust? So I can understand being on the federal investigation, Bureau of Investigation side of it. That's frustrating because you know this guy's phone has the answers in it. You know it does. You know it does. You could use that. I can also understand. It did. I, it did. I can also understand the private citizen version of it in a situation where most companies don't do that, by the way. Saying, I agree with you. Fuck, I wish I could help you out. But if I do this, who else am I going to do it for? All right. So here's here's my thought. Would you rather? Oh, we're playing. Would you rather? I'm trying to think about how you're bringing up some good shit. All right. So I'm getting that shit anyway, right? Mm, I'm glad right? you said so, that. Go ahead. So, would you rather I go about it? in a way that allows me <sighs> this is tough this is tough so would if i'm cooperate would you rather have a company that cooperates through the letter to the letter of the law i.e. we have given you more than enough probable cause slash i would i would beyond a reasonable doubt that that phone includes information that could protect not only national security on a 
40,000 foot view, but specific instances that are documented, specific, not instances, threats, straight up threats that are documented on that phone that we need to expedite for the safety of individuals, right? Would you rather I, would you rather that we go through that process, which we both know is lengthy, right? So, um, and we're proving it to you. We're, we're basically winning. We're convicting at trial. That's how much we're giving you as, as a member of this organization that has this technology. Or would you rather I fucking jump into it in 30 seconds in the back room of a fucking overseas hotel? My answer? Yeah. I'd rather see you go through court 100%. Okay. And I'd rather see my taxpayer money wasted on that. And I'll tell, no, excuse me, not wasted, put towards that. And I'll tell you why. But what do you think about, what do you think about the victims, the potential victims or, oh, or the known victims that we know, I, I know people, other people perished. Here's where I'll defend you. Based on that decision. Here's where I'll defend your side. No matter what answer you give here, there's collateral damage. In that case, if I answer the way I did against what you did, other or, people or die. how you answer it, potentially, potentially, or in my from my level of knowledge, definitely. Okay, let's go with def. Let's be conservative and say definitely. I also let's add to that. I have what was it like twenty five victims or something like that? Uh, yeah, I think that's right. I have all their families, who now. They already have the guy who did it dead, so there's a level of justice that will never happen. But now I open up the opportunity to drag this out even more and affect them in the process. Which, by the way, and you understand this, 9-11 families know all too much with the beautiful country of Saudi Arabia and what's happened there. Finally, the paperwork was released, right? Documents. I, really? Yeah, I think so. I actually didn't see that. I think so. Okay, I think we'll, so. we'll I think get so. to that. Yeah. But the precedent here is everything. I, when you listen to this back again, you'll hear the words you used, and I'm not surprised to hear you use them because it was also your life, and there's an extent to which they're very important, but you'll hear the words like, as a matter of national security, preventing future threats, saving lives, doing all these things, whatever. It's the same thing that I hit on people overblowing what is a bad thing with coronavirus, but using it to the extent of total control and never right. stopping this pandemic. Though that language is the language that Cheney and Bush and Rumsfeld used to put through all these archaic fucking laws, including the Patriot Act, including the program that was illegal, Stellar Wind. It's a matter John Ashcroft, you're on your you're on your fucking potential deathbed here, but it's a matter of national security. And if you don't sign well, that page, people are gonna die. My answer is, unfortunately, well, people do die. Unfortunately, bad people exist. Unfortunately, some of these situations will happen. What is the cost of continuing government intervention and reach and control into all private citizens' lives to the point that eventually they can just fucking get everything? Versus if well, Tim Cook knows – I just want to say this last thing. If Tim Cook knows that you're eventually going to get that because you're going to prove this shit in court – at least he had the check and balance to make you do it. He doesn't want those victims to have to sit out there an extra year while this goes through court. He hates that collateral damage. He's a human being. I understand that. But he understands the bigger picture of if I fucking give this up, we know this guy's guilty. What about the next guy? Well, I, I understand what you're saying. I think, I think that what is difficult for most that haven't been in the game, and the game is a wrong expression, but – been in the profession is the targeted, you know, kind of piece that's missing, right? So when I say I can tell you that everything I'm worth, everything I've lived for and done, it is it is not a far reaching scope when it comes to what we what we need, what we need it, what we've been able to obtain in any way we need to obtain it right because my my like i said or on this podcast you know i am an Ameri i i that's non-negotiable mm. my american status and my my fight to always be 
to put this flag, you know, on on the on the front, you know, when, when my epitaph will read, you know, might not even read for God, but it'll read for country. Yeah. Right. And you back that up. And I back in it in every way. So, you know, my thought is and I understand I understand what he what his decision was. I understand why he made it. I understand what his intent was. However, that I, being said, I appreciate, I appreciate yeah, that. Yeah, I, I, I do. That. But but I also want people to understand that. And listen, we have not, the, the intelligence community, I'm not talking about just the FBI. I'm talking about the intelligence community, ha, has not done a great job at explaining and following <laughs> through with our target with targeted approach. All right. Mm -hmm. So the only thing that's been public, the millions of times that we were perfect doesn't get published. You know, it doesn't get publicized. That's fair. I but, agree with that. But the times that we fucked up were really bad yes. fuck-ups, right? So I think that I want people to understand that we are those professionals in the intel community that do the job the way it was defined to be done because it's it's duty and it's it's you know, it's duty on our country, right? It's the it's the right thing to do. You know, what what do they say about character? It's doing the right thing even when nobody's looking. Right, God, I hope or, my dad doesn't hear that. Right, or or he doing killed, he killed that quote for me. <laughs> you just always say it, but God or also, you know, we we used to explain it at West Point, right? Um, one of the one of the freshman responsibilities. There's three major responsibilities at West Point, right? There's the head laundry carrier. So laundry carriers, that is a shit job because you're basically they send out all their laundry, the upper class, and their shoes, and you you're responsible to find all that shit and bring it back to the room. That's one, right? Then there's a, a minute caller, right? Which minute callers stand outside by the clock and they're the human alarm clocks even to this day. And what they do is, sir, there are 10 and about minutes to accountability formation. The uniform for accountability formation is this. The menu for lunch is this. And they, they go each minute and they count it down. That's okay, but you get you get destroyed while you're standing out there for having a bad uniform. And then the, the final thing is head, head mail carrier. And part of head mail carrier's duties is to drop off a copy of the fucking New York Times <laughs> Every every morning in front of each upper class and even your classmates' door. The failing New York Times. The failing New York Times. Yeah, fake Dems. news. So if pa if Pop wants to win, by the way, you should start talking like this oh with God. the finger. Well, like, got to get him off, tweet, the failing, off Twitter. The failing the failing New York, York Times. Times. Yeah. So, but at least a hey, listen. Baldwin should do that when he shot and killed the guy. Anyway, um, <laughs> so. <laughs> So Woo, that was fresh. He, here's the thing, right? Yeah, too soon. But the thing we used to say, right? There's this whole process, and I know I'm going a little deeper on this, but there's a whole process about squaring corners when you're at West Point. So what you're doing is picture, you know, picture a, a dormitory hallway with stairs and doors and everything else. You would have to walk on the far side away from upper class or anybody's rooms far side pinging at 120 steps per minute, right? And you would walk down in any corner. If there was a kind of a jutting piece of the lavatory, you would walk around it, square every corner and going. Now, when everybody's looking during lunch formation, during dinner formation, you do it, right? But in the morning at 5 a.m., when you're picking up the cold copies of the New York Times, they still do it to this day, even with a, a digital version. And you're snapping out those deals in your fall. I think we're supporting single-handedly supporting the New York Times at the <laughs> service academies. And you would drop a copy of that paper. You would square. You would walk up, square it, walk up, drop it, turn around, do an about face, walk to the wall, go to the next one. I'm so interested well, in where you're going with well, this. Well, well, you know, what's what is a duty concept? A duty concept says do the do what you're supposed to be doing even when no one's looking. Mm. So we used to say if you're a freshman who cuts corners at 5 a.m., you're going to cut corners for the rest of your life. On the battlefield. Right? Mm. Or you're going to cut corners when you probably should provide a targeted in information packet or what we call a targeting package to Apple in order to show them this is exactly what needs to be done. Here's the scope of it, right? Now, that being said... There's guys that don't. There's guys that don't square the corner at 5 a.m. Let's assume they did, though. I want you to assume they did. Yeah. Let's be conservative. Let's. Uh, and, I'm here and to I, tell you, I did. All right. Oh, you were involved. Well, on many things. Okay. I, I won't. 
confirm or deny the Sam oh, you're Bernardino. Me the old confirm or deny. Well, well, of course I was fucking involved in that. Let's, so let's let's, let's be ass- honest. I'm getting looser. Let's yeah. assume they did. I would have loved to be a fly on the wall for you and Tim Cook. Hey Tim, come over here. Take a seat. <laughs> but anyway, it didn't work, I guess. No. Let's assume they did that. The public reads headlines. Of course. The headline is Tim Cook hands over unlocks iPhone. They don't give a fuck. The average person, the court of public opinion, and Tim Cook knows this, doesn't give a fuck about the fourth paragraph where they explain that Special Agent Jim DiOrio laid out the exact evidence that included X, Y, and Z. Well, how about Apple turns, you know, Tim Cook turns over San Bernardino bombers, shooters, uh, cell phone, um, you know, based on threats to hundreds of people in the Southern California Again, county. Look at look at our. You have to understand previous trust in this country. The last person to be saying that left and right. The last people were Dick Cheney, George Bush, and Donald Rumsfeld. And then it just continued with every administration after them. No one stopped that. I I understand, but you know, I I just this is where it's like the I just inside. think it's yeah. yeah, yeah I mean, I so it. would you rather? Would the American public feel better with no headline, and we just get the fucking information? Now I'll relate it to this. Would I mean, the Ameri- we, would the American do pu- that? Would the American public feel good with two weeks to stop the curve? Oh, yeah. You see what I'm saying? Unf- and look, I understand. You're in there. You're biased. Your job, I think it's, correct me if I'm wrong, it's literally written in part of like the code with the FBI, is to protect and serve and protect American lives specifically. I think it's, the, you know, it's funny. I don't think I don't know that it. Ha- I think it just says to collect evidence and crimes that against the best interests of the United States. Fucking, Honestly, fucking J. Edgar Hoover, man. This I guy know. Was fucked and up. to wear dresses. Yeah, I, and I, to I, wear skirts. <laughs> All right, which we, there's we, nothing we, wrong with that because it doubles your chances on a Saturday night. Okay. All right. Um, we're gonna sorry. Gonna slide, sorry. About gonna that. Slide right yeah. past that one, but there is a. My point is, there's an understanding here that you have a job to do. And this is a prototypical red line in the sand check to the balance where you're not going to like the outcome if my argument as a private citizen in this case wins. But I appreciate as a private citizen two things. A, being able to have that voice because as frustrating as it might be for you, I can see the bigger picture here. And I have – this is before coronavirus even. I have precedent to prove that that's never a good sign. When when you're getting promised like, but we're going to prevent all this stuff, unfortunately – not everyone at the government's a good guy like you. I know you, right? And by the way, I'm like I have other guys on this podcast who may have leadership roles in society in the future. I always point to Terrence Jones, I point to Mike Spear, they're my liberal and conservative go-tos. I even tell them, I'm like, I was even telling Terrence's dad this the other day. I'm like, I hope that when that happens, he doesn't change. Right. Because I think anyone's susceptible to it. I think you and me are both susceptible to it. I think there's all kinds of bullshit things that happen. But you've lived your life in public service. You come on here in front of this camera to talk about this shit. I think people, if if they can't understand that you're an open book on this kind of stuff at this point, I can't help them. So right. I'm going to use that as as an example of you're a good guy in there. You're a guy that when you say that to me, I believe you. I think that's what you mean it by. I know that there are a lot of other people who exist who, by the way, exist at way higher positions than even you had. You know, guys who are fucking in the executive suite who are like, oh, yeah, that's a, you know what? Exactly. You know what? Yeah, it's national security. Well, we saw it. We saw it. So when I see this, I say, I would much rather them have to play it out in court for a year where they'll win and at least have Tim Cook, even though he'll annoy you, have the precedent of being able to have a beer with you after and say, Jim, as a private citizen, I appreciate what you did. I appreciate the fact that you won fair and square in court. Here's the iPhone. Let's go. I hope you understand it was a precedent situation. And I think I would. Okay. Yeah, yeah. and I think I would. And, and I will tell you that I think the, I think the caveat that we I was mentioning is, you know, basically your – you know your emergency situation, right? Yes. So, so that that everybody understands, right? Yes. Because we've got a pending. You know, we we've got something that's happening as we speak. So, we're we have to be reactive there. I think everybody. So, I understand. I kind of understand what you're saying. I I think in this case it was questionable as to whether or not we had 
an exigent circumstance. Wait, wait, so actually, in other what words, does exigent mean? it means like it's something that's occurring or, or going to happen shortly and we needed some more information quickly. Now, what I understand from your standpoint is we don't want, listen, like, like my old, you know, my, my old, um, profiling, you know, we, we called it, um, what the hell was it? Behavioral science. And no, it was, um, I'm thinking of West Point behavioral science. Um, oh my God. Behavioral, the BAU, um, whatever the FBI's profilers, um, like my, my buddy used to say there, you wouldn't want me climbing around in your head for a couple of days. Mm. So it's, if you take that, and I wouldn't, because the fucking guy would figure out shit that I didn't even know about myself, right? So it's the same thing. I think what he's talking about and his protection of those that, that hold and, and subscribe and have an Apple phone in their, in their life in there is, can we trust the fact that we're going to scope out? We're going to stay in the scope, right? So I get that. And and I can tell you that even with the best intentions, because we've been talking a lot about intentions, even with guys and girls who are monitoring what we call, you know, Title Three wiretaps, so which which is people just think, you know, because TV makes it look and the movies make it look like I could just, I want to listen to your phone, fuck it. Now, now, what you talked about earlier with the Patriot Act, that was closer to the truth of being able to plug into your fucking phone if I could prove, in fact, you had anything to do with a terrorist plot or you were associated with a terrorist. Right? No, you'll, you'll actually appreciate that. Yeah. Appreciate this. Have you heard what Snowden says about that? Absolutely. Absolutely. The Save, the Save the Puppies Act Absolutely. and everything? Absolutely. Absolutely. spot on about that. And, and I don't disagree. But, yeah. but my point is... Um, even with uh, all right, so so we get. Let's just say I spend my time, and and, and remember, a Title Three, a wiretap. It, although it looks on TV in the movies like that's the first thing we do. Well, you know, we're gonna track this guy. We'll fucking get him. That is that is the you have to prove that everything else has been exhausted to include interviews, to including me walking up to you and saying, mm. "Are you a fucking cartel member? Are I you a cop? Are you a, are you, you a fucking cop? Exactly. Just practice." Right. So I got to, I got to, so everything. So surveillance, you got to prove why surveillance right. wouldn't be fruitful, right? Everything, go through it before I can get you up on, before I can get your phone wired up, right? Then on top of that, I have to minimize, I'm supposed to, they have these minimization briefings weekly, daily, where a federal prosecutor comes in and say, if you are, you know, if you hear information with regards to, um, you know, the guy's latest guma, you know, you can't listen to it because it's got nothing to do with the fact that, you know, he was extorting, uh, you know, business owners in Turnersville, New Jersey. You're, you know? listen, you're listening. Right. Well, well I mean, listening. what what is the. No, I mean, listen, you're minimizing. You're turning it off. You're minimizing. You're okay. minimizing. Now you can spot check every minute. Right. And if you hear something that makes sense, you can come back on now. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you, th there's guys that are just plain fucking stupid that don't put it, they don't even understand the, the, the case. And I've got you, who gets to monitor, who do you think gets to monitor, monitor midnight to 5 a.m. wiretaps? Jim Callstrom? Yeah, yeah. He, he hasn't worked a day, just a, an honest day in his life, but. Ooh. No, I like Jim. He's a good Ooh, dude. Shots fired. But, but I'm saying he's not a 12 to 5 guy. You're yeah. going to get the junior guy, right, that doesn't really understand. What is this all? What is this whole thing about? You know, I'm going to. So there are times when you listen to a little so bit more. So should. basically the guy. But you're not, che you're not cheating on it. You know, you're, and, and if you do hear something and you use it, it gets thrown out anyway, right? But ultimately, <laughs> ultimately it could, it could cause a situation where, you know, you are um, overreaching. I, I will give you that. There could be, but again, remember that stuff handled by any defense attorney, not even a good defense attorney, it's going to get chucked. Yeah, I could see the guy. It's going to get chucked. I, I could see the federal prosecutor in one of his cute little minimization meetings, looking at the twelve to five guy, saying, "You know, why did you record the quote unquote mobster A fucking his gumar?" Well, sir, she said, "Quote, choke me, daddy," and I thought we were going to. Well, I thought we were going to have a murder. We're going to have a murder. Like you, right. you see where that's fucking going. Right. Like, I mean, well, well, shit. You know, stuff has stuff has happened along the way with different. You know, I mean, just misunderstandings and things. I, I think I told the story last time about the guy. I don't know if I told the story. I, you know, here's a simple here's a simple a thing that can happen, so right? So, not. so we we have a major a major case against a Monmouth County mayor 
who wind up getting convicted and spending six years because another guy that I told, were you fucking crazy going to trial? Here's what we got on you. You told about the guy who went to trial, about the trial itself, where his wife said, I hope you die of fucking right. pain. Right. No, that's even whatever. different one. That's so, a different so one. This, so this one, what happens, talking kind of what we're going to, is he winds up, we wind up having a meeting with myself, the chief of the corruption unit uh, in the U.S. Attorney's Office in, in New Jersey, and a... Uh, U.S. Attorney's Office investigator, by the way, another West Point guy, great dude, right? And in the meeting, we decide that we are going to interview the target, the mayor. That's the comes out. We're going to interview it. We're going to interview him. That's it. I write an email to the investigator copying the federal prosecutor that just says, let's set up X, the guy, meaning we just talked about a meeting, right? We're going we're gonna to interview him. Let's set it up. Well, what does the defense attorney do, right? So so it's a perfect opportunity. So he, he has me on the stand for three hours, and all we talked about is the meaning of let's set up so-and-so. Mm. Oh, you fucking, you're going to set him up. He didn't do anything, right? So finally, what did I what did I do? I got, he, he the guy would just badgered, badgered. I couldn't get a word in. I had the jury, because what they do at the beginning is they announce your military service, that you're West Point guy and everything else and everything else. So I, finally I said, you know, he wouldn't let me just yes, no, quote, and so fine. I said, you know, um, can I speak? He said, no, I'm done. Fuck you. So on recross, right, so I redirect. So the prosecutor comes up and says, Agent Theorio, tell tell us what you meant by that. He said, well, I said, in West Point, we learn about intent, mm, right? Right back and, to that. And my intent was simply to set up a meeting. And here's... You know, here's the here's the notes, my notes, and and the jury just looked, and basically afterwards, the jury had we get to poll the jury and talk to them. Jury's like, man, we can't believe you wasted three hours of your life on that one thing. We we knew the guy, we we were convicting the guy two seconds after that display. So and my, again, my you point have, is, you have good. In, here's the thing, though, I need to point this out, yeah. and then I'll let you finish. Yeah. You have good intent there, I believe. Absolutely, listening to that, hundred percent. Could you see how there are other hacks? Without a doubt, maybe wouldn't. Without a doubt, but but my my point there is it's always going to play out, um, not always. Yeah, it's, it's going to play it's going to play out the way it's meant to play out, mm. right? So if that if you do have a corrupt or a <laughs> corrupt is tough for me. Like it's not. I think we talked about this before. It's not corrupt. It, it's it's lazy. Right. It's apathetic. It's unavailable. It's no drive. It's fuck. I can't believe I'm doing this job when there's thousands of people that want the job, right? So I think that's what you find is you know what I'm. I'll just I'll write whatever I'll do. I'll listen. I'm I'm. I just don't give a shit. I'll let somebody else have to deal with this. Mm. So I'll listen when I'm not supposed to. Well, what does that cause for me? It causes me to have to go back through my case and look at everything that that person found and any lead that he yep. tried to generate based on the information that we weren't entitled to. So it kind of goes back to the same deal when you talk about Apple. You know, I get it because they don't always know that that's going to be me. And I'm not just saying me. There's Listen, the majority, the majority, yes. the, the strong yes. majority of us that did this job did it with the with the appropriate intent. Right. Right. But even some of the one thirders. Mostly all of the one thirders because they didn't do fucking shit. <laughs> right? So I would say all. I'd give them hundred percent. By the way, it's just, those just middle quick, of the road guys. Quick note for people who didn't hear the last episode, one thirder is somebody who was a desk lackey, just fucking went to the crossword paycheck, puzzle in the, the New York Times. Exactly. Didn't New York fucking Times make crossword cases. puzzle. New York Times but, crossword puzzle. You but, didn't like that. But you know, I was pretty good at it. Not Fridays, but, but go um, ahead. sorry. But but I think that's kind of it goes back to that. I get it. Like I I can completely understand it, and I can respect the decision. I think my frustration is, and it was always my frustration as an agent, as a as a as a street agent who who did the job the way it was supposed to be done in my eye. You know, my eyes, and I, and I got a lot of validation based on that. Is I you know. The, the best prosecutors would say, I want the bowl full and the lid sealed. I don't want I don't want you bringing stuff that even has a question of us not following every single lead, every lead. You know, if I did a, if I had if I had a case, I was following it, 
towards the end, just to prove, because a big part of it is proving, you know, it's follow the money, right? So if you had a corruption case, it's it's one thing to have a guy or three guys or 10 guys saying, oh, yeah, without any, you know, if you have a recording device on them, obviously it's good. But, uh, you know, hey, I paid the man. You know, I paid him. Okay. Well, how do we prove that? Well, you know, it's a simple source and application investigation. If you make $100,000 and you spent $500,000 and you have no inheritance and you don't use credit cards, I'm following your ass into every place you go. You go into, you know, the Wharfside patio bar in Point Pleasant at, you know, 5 o'clock on a Friday night. Guess when I'm going in? 7.30 when you leave. And I'm going to ask, how'd the guy pay? I'm with the FBI. How'd the guy pay? And I'm going to mark it down. That was my that was my way of doing of working cases besides everything else that I did, and that was the that was the sealing the lid, right? But not everybody does that. But if I went to if I went to Apple, I felt like he should have given me the benefit of the doubt. But why should he? He doesn't know me. And that's it. It's your intent there. Like, and we're we're coming back to that point. But I I need to say this in in plain English so that we understand it completely. How many people who have been in that type of a capacity, including the good ones, a lot of good ones, how many people would be willing to go in front of that and go in front of this and talk about it on the record like that? Not a lot of them. They don't do it. They don't do it. And, and by the way, I'm not even faulting a lot of the guys for that. But you have to understand that like that makes you unique and so I can sit here and I think people can listen to this right now and be like, wow, this is really credible. Like this guy, whether or not they agree with everything you're saying or not, and there's going to be points where people do, don't, whatever. Depends on who you are. They're going to be like, this guy is putting his money where his mouth is and he's, he's telling it to me the way he sees it or saw it in that job. People will appreciate that. They will then remember that you are the exception, not the rule. So I, I get it. But it, it also makes me think of and this is a little different, but it's the same lane. It makes me think of the Ross Ulbricht Silk Road case. Now, you're at least somewhat familiar with this, right? I know you didn't work on this personally, but okay. So Ross Ulbricht, I, I have – this is another one I have a very clear down-the-middle view on. Ross Ulbricht had to go to jail. He broke the law. Whether or not it was based on a political belief, which it was, creating the Silk Road for people that don't know, it was the website that basically allowed global free access to drugs. You make your own decision. It was based on the fact that he was a radical libertarian and believed in individual rights and freedom, and so he wanted to create an outlet using the internet and Bitcoin where people could do that. Fine. You, I understand in a society of laws, even if some are a little dated and we got to fix them, you can't break every international law. And be like, well, you were making a point. No, you you, you got to get convicted for that. You got to go to jail if, if you're caught. No problem. What happened to him was fucked up. He went to jail for a double life sentence and was serving it. Now he's in another bad one, but he was in Florence Supermax with like mm -hmm. El Chapo, mm -hmm. Robert Hansen, who we were talking about. The worst of the worst people, right? That was a – and the case was a total government hit job once it got to court. The other place where it was a government hit job and where there were people in the FBI who – I'm. by the way, I'm not even going to call them bad people. I'm not going to do – I don't know them. Mm. And I'll respect the fact that maybe you could empathize with where they were coming from. There was a team in the FBI – there were multiple teams along with other agencies, by the way. IRS was involved. DEA was involved. DEA, I'm sure. And the DEA yep. fucked up. They had like two – Two guys go rogue and go to jail. That's a, that's a side Shocker. Story. Shocker right there. But anyway, there was a guy named Chris Tarbell who was an FBI agent. I believe he was New York office and he was cyber. Okay. Like that was – I don't know if he was himself cyber, but he was heading up like the cyber team for this. Okay. Makes sense. And the way that they got Ross Ulbrich was through his server, which was – code name like frosty or something okay and to the credit of i think it was the i could be remembering this wrong so people please go fact check this i think it was the irs agent who had discovered some old weird through google some old weird chat rooms where certain code names had been used and he figured out that ross used the code word frosty they figured out that this server that i believe existed out of iceland again please check that but it was somewhere was tied to Ross on the other side, and it would be their proof that he was Dread Pirate Roberts, which was DPR, the code name of the quote-unquote head of the Silk Road. 
And so they had their deductive reasoning. Mm -hmm. They had their end result. They knew they had them red handed. They knew that they could get them and, and they had to stop this. They mm -hmm. had to bring them down. Right. I agree with them a thousand percent, but they wanted the result and they didn't have a way in. And so very long story short, and I won't go fully into detail because I'm not the educated guy to explain it. You can talk to any hacker. You can talk to any software engineer, anyone who's like in the know with this shit. The FBI got a hold of this frosty server. And the explanation that they later gave under duress, it was one of the few things that the public actually was able to like get out in this case. The explanation that they later gave to give a long to make a long story short publicly has been refuted by anyone who has any idea what a basic hack is. They're like, that's not even possible. Essentially, what what we can practically confirm is that the FBI got in there, not legally. They didn't get in there via the warrant. They didn't get in there via, and I'm gonna get over my head here so I won't go past that, but th they didn't get in there the right way. And they were able to make this case against Ross Ulbrich, and then on top of that, it was a closed courtroom, government hit job, they gave him double life for no violent crimes. They even, and, and this was fucked up, in the court of public opinion, when they caught him, they put out there that he put out all these hits on people. Mm. He didn't do it. In fact, he didn't do it so much that when they went to, before trial, they dropped all those charges and they didn't tell anyone that at that point because there were multiple, and this is, I'll, this is 100%, there were multiple Dread Pirate Roberts. Mm. So there were other people who ordered like hits on copycat and no, no. Or just, just other people access. that they, they missed, they, they didn't identify properly. He gave access to them or because he got in over his head and he met these other people online who believed in these libertarian beliefs and they played them. And gotcha. he gave him that. That's what happened. So he actually gave access to his. Yes. And so they, accounts. they used it. And, and again, but he people, was respond. He took the hit. Let me be respectful here to the legal process and say, this is alleged. This is technically not guaranteed. Based on my opinion and my understanding of the case and reviewing everything, I'm telling you I'm 100%. So I, I want to put the bias out there. But they were able to beat him in the court of public opinion, close the trial off from public. And then when he was convicted, it was a five to ten year sentence, which by the way I support. You, you got to do that. It's called deterrence. You can't do this. They gave him double life, no parole, federal, Florence Supermax, quiet, sent away. And then he's another guy, Trump left hanging at the end there with, with, with the pardon. I look at this and I say. Where was it, it tried? Was it, it District of New York? Southern District in New York. Okay. It was in front of Berman, I think. No, Berman's the DC judge. I forget her name. It was a different judge. I'm sorry. Okay. I'll look it up later. But I say that because I look at Chris Tarbell and he's the name we know. There's other people involved. It might not have even been him with this decision or whatever. And I go. Were their intentions wrong? Because they weren't the one giving the sentence, though they celebrated it afterwards. I thought that was wrong. Were their intentions wrong? No. They were trying to catch a guy who was running an international drug ring. Let's call it what it was. This was a place where people could go buy drugs. You can't do that. Even if I agree with so his... it was it was supporting it was supporting existing drug cartels and basically no, giving no. them an opportunity to that actually the opposite. It was fucking over the cartels. The car I, I so can't how, believe the Mexicans didn't get to them before the feds did. So you would like just uh, uh, elementary, you know, basically I want drug. I need, exactly. I need a kilo. Anything. So I just basically use this program and then I make my payment on there and then In it's Bitcoin. delivered by some the mail. runner. No. It's just In mailed. the fucking mail. It was, so, it was so simple. That's how it fell under its own weight. Right. So, and then even some of the other guys who were quote unquote DPR who got in there, they encouraged them to put like guns on there and shit and, where it got, okay. where it so got dangerous. running arms and again, sending hits and all that shit. Let me be clear had to go to jail. This was not a, this isn't a, like when I was. Did they publish a guideline before he was sentenced? Like, you know what I no. mean? Like a federal guideline and say, hey, no. this particular. No, Jim. So he was indicted and then went to trial in the Southern District. Behind closed doors, no cameras in there. Oh, one day, Ross Ulbricht, double life sentence, no parole. Well, in all fairness, there's no cameras ever allowed in federal court. There was a lack of media coverage on this period. So they, they basically closed it down, but it was just... It was a hush-hush under the table. 
I I I know. Do you that. know who is? Do you know who is his defense attorney? I'd be interested to know who that was. I forget his mom. His mom. It's so hard to watch. Mitch actually interviewed her a few years ago mm. at in in Philly at a conference that he was running media for, and he did check that out. Mitch Lexamana, my buddy, did that. Your friend too mm -hmm. did that back in 2018 with Lynn Ulbrich, and he did a great job. And it was it was only like 15 20 minutes, but it's a tough spot because. And I, I, I always make sure I say that when I was advocating towards the end of Trump's presidency to, to get him, I was clearly saying commutation, not a pardon. Right. You cannot pardon him. Right. I would look him in the eyes and say, you know, Ross, you had to go to jail. Right. You, but he, you, you broke the but, law. But your your point is that he served, it should be time served. And his intentions were not horrible. They were actually good. Unfortunately, with intentions, and this is important, number one, negligence is not an excuse. We know that. Number two, just because you have the right intentions on certain things that involve directly breaking not just federal law, international law. This was around the world. Right. Because you want to make a political statement, in this case as a libertarian, does not give you the right to do that. Like you can't the, – the, you want to talk about slippery slopes? If that went unpunished, which technically it should have because they broke the law to get in there, but that would have been disastrous. Like you can't let that go. However – when they went to get their result, they did it in very clearly in a legal way. And now this guy for a non for a nonviolent crime is never gonna get out of an eight by four cell, which to me is fucking insane. You know, and so I, I have a I have it's it's a different like when I look at Snowden, I go, pardon the motherfucker, get him back here, let's do our thing. I don't look at Ross like that. I go, well, you know. You lose some. How much time has he served so he's far? Been, he's been in there for a, a, almost a decade. Wow. Yeah, 2013 he got caught, and it's like I look at this and I go, maybe Chris Tarbell bad, maybe not. Either way, the system is incentivized for him to go get it, and so when the you, sentence is beyond like for me, so so just in in cutting in real quick. No, please. There's a couple pieces to this that you know. First off, there there's there's a side of. All right, that seems like a good place to leave it with a little cliffhanger for next week. If you guys enjoyed this episode, though, I would really, really appreciate it if you shared it with a friend who enjoys podcasts and particularly with a friend who enjoys podcasts to cover the type of subject matter that we just did. The best way I can grow this thing is through good old-fashioned word-of-mouth marketing. And to all the people who have done that, especially over the past several months, thank you so much. I see that all the time. It's in my DMs where new listeners tell me they found the show through a friend. So please continue doing that to all the people who haven't yet. If you can do that, it would be an enormous, enormous help. So thank you once again to all of you. And I already can't wait for next week. I know you guys are going to enjoy that one too. That said, you know what it is. Give it a thought. Get back to me. Peace.